Awesome. Hello and uh, welcome to my podcast. I'm your host, uh, Larry Du, and uh, today I'm joined by Mike Bull. So, yeah, uh, Mike, welcome uh, to the podcast. Glad to be back after the election, 2024. <laughs> We're back. Yeah, so just uh, so was what goes through your mind there? I mean, uh, about this, yeah. uh, what was it surprising to you as a result? Uh, yeah, actually, it was. Um, I was up all night and I was watching the election results, and it was sort of uh, a feeling uh, uh, at first that maybe things are really close, and then it just kind of compiled and bad news, you know. Uh, you know, I was rooting for the the Harris camp, and I was like, "Wow, this okay, Trump 2.0." You know, I think I, I think it got so late to where I just like fell asleep and I just went to bed. Uh, but yeah, it was it was it is what it is. You know, uh, it was a real shock uh, for people that identify, I guess, uh, as progressive liberal and. And even in my own circle of friends, there was still a digesting. A lot of people still digesting, you know, what happened, why it happened, and who's to blame, and you know, well, how how it's gonna, you know, look like in the next four years. So I don't know about what about you. What were you doing on that day, election day? Were you? Yeah, well, so I I I was hoping that Harris was gonna win, but uh, yeah. I was also expecting that. Uh... You know that that Trump could win. Uh, there were some polls that were suggesting mm -hmm. that he was doing quite well in the swing states, uh, and he did win uh, every single uh, swing state. Um, and uh, yeah. I'm gonna do a little bit of uh, screen share uh, if you don't yeah, yeah, mind, do. uh, yeah. because I, because I think there were a few uh, graphics uh, that. Um, cool. uh, might be quite useful and insightful uh, for us to. Yeah, uh, too long, yeah, to 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 look at, yeah. Uh, so the Financial Times uh, shows the um, the the margin, right, right uh, of uh, change. So that is, if you take the twenty twenty four vote, right, and compare it to the twenty twenty vote, right, because uh, I oftentimes I think that you know marginal vote analysis uh, is more useful uh, than you know, just uh, like the, the straight, straight up like absolute percentage, um, because you want to see like how the electorate has been shifting on net, and uh, you can see at the top of the graph, um, not surprisingly that you know the white non-college men and women, uh, here decomposed, are the core base of the Trump electorate, mm -hmm. uh, but that has not changed from, you know the last two elections that he was on the ballot, right? All right. Um, yeah, we also know that generally among males, whites, right, uh, that he's doing quite well. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 and, you know, we can see, f but th there are two interesting results in my view. So where did Harris improve? She improved on the 65 plus. All right. Right, the older voters. And the white college educated women, uh, I guess, okay. marginal improvement. Right. And, you know, I would say that, you know, certainly the older people, um, you know, they, they might be um, like wealthier, you could say, mm -hmm. right? They have more assets uh, and maybe they were a little bit less concerned with uh, inflation uh, right. and, and, and they were more receptive to the democratic message. Uh, which was, um, you know, like we have to save democracy. You know, we have to stop fascism, right? Uh, we have to uh, prevent uh, Trump from trampling on the democratic institutions, right? Um, and, so, and so that message was certainly uh, cutting through. Uh, and then for the white college women, I would say abortion was probably the main motivator right because right. It certainly right. was a concern that the conservative rights yeah yeah, yeah. they're going to take over again and then they're going to nominate the supreme court um and uh, it's going to you know reduce the the rights for women to have an abortion no um 
but really the yeah, you know, what the Democrats should be really shocked by is what you see at the bottom, right? So yeah. the young people, huge Hispanic. modular shifts. Hispanic, mm -hmm. Asian, and black, uh, a little bit less here. Because right. if, if we do the decomposition by gender, so I think black women were showing up for Harris. Um, you know, I, th I think they recognize the, the you know, historicity of, you know, first yeah, black I think I think it was a, uh, the black uh, component, not on this graph, but I think it was uh, as high as 80% of uh, black voters. But there was a, a discrepancy between black male voters and black female voters. Uh, I, don't, I don't see the statistic here, but I'm trying to remember what I saw. But also the rural uh, vote in the urban versus suburbs, that might have been interesting if we had a statistic on that. Yeah, it's on this graph, uh, yeah. but uh, but I know that there, there were, I mean, but it was similar to 2020 in a way that, like, the urban counties were, you know, pro-democratic, Yeah, the rural counties were pro-republican, uh, but what has happened is that some of the, you could say, suburban counties, which are really the swing vote in any election, uh, they all went pro-Trump, right? You know, like, I mean, when it used to be Biden, and then now mm -hmm. they're pro-Trump. Uh, yeah. So it's been uh, a, a very big shift. Um, and then the urban centers, um, you know, the, 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 there was some, uh, you, you could say, uh, yeah, like the, with, with the urban counties, I think they, they, they stay uh, democratic. Uh, yeah. I, I saw like there's a few counties like around Seattle, for instance, they became, yeah. you know, slightly more democratic. Uh, the same, yeah. I was going to add in the same patterns still exist in Texas metropolitan areas, uh, city of Dallas, uh, DFW, Houston, uh, uh, El Paso, uh, historically, you know, have a dem dem democratic uh, favor. Uh, but then as soon as you get outside the cities, yeah, you have a, a rural uh, pattern where it goes conservative, very conservative, right? So it, it I think it repeats this whole uh, urban rural dichotomy, but we don't you know like you said we also need to take the suburbs very serious. Uh, suburbs are also uh, shifting uh, trends, right? Oh wow, you have it all here. Yeah, so the, the New York yeah. Times actually does a very good job, yeah. uh, and a lot of uh, visual visual. <laughs> yeah, examples. so basically almost every county was like you know net Republican. Yeah. Um. So there were a few that, like, yeah, here in Washington State, the urban counties, uh, you know, there were a few counties that became a little bit more democratic. But everything else is going red. Yeah, um, red way. And, 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 and then Harris also had a pretty good ground game in the Atlanta region uh, yeah. in, in the northern part of Georgia. Yeah. And... Uh, and then if you look at the decisive uh, swing states. Pennsylvania, right? Yeah. In Pennsylvania, for instance, yeah, it's like everything went more Republican. Uh, and then I saw even in New York City, I mean, which is it's supposed to yeah. be kind of the most liberal place yeah. uh, in, in the entire country. I mean, you see large module shifts, right? Yeah. 11 points here. 14 points, 11 points. Uh, so, yeah, all of the... Well, uh, the um, it would be interesting, you know, when the midterms happen. I know it's two two years away. If there's continuity to this pattern that it shifts further in uh, favor of Republicans, or this was just a unique, you know, event, time, uh, where it's just unexplainable, you know, it just shifts to the right, like it shifted in Europe everywhere. You know, think of uh, Austria, think Germany, AfD. Uh, maybe it's just the, these four years. I don't know. Uh, unique situation. You know, they. You know, the term sometimes people use is American exceptionalism. You know, like, but I think maybe it, it maybe just spontaneous. You know, maybe just could uh, an incumbent president. You know, and it's hard for an incumbent uh, vice president to try to win in such a scenario especially if the political rhetoric is always going, trying to align the individual with the, an established, 
you know, establishment, a president, you know, in this case, Biden. So I don't know if it's just unique. We'll we'll find out, you know, if it's it's if it's a will be a continuous trend that even New York <laughs> turns one day into a red state or. Uh, but I think maybe by midterm elections, we'll really find out if it's, you know, it's permanent or has continuity or yeah something. well i mean the, the the main factor is that uh, the, the the people cared about inflation and they cared yeah. about the border uh, i'm not sure where the crime was the main thing because you know, even though trump kept talking about it but uh, you know it didn't really pop out as uh, as one of the major issues uh, and when he did try to bring it up i mean he kind of made himself ridiculous you know by referring to like the pet no. eating, right? Um, yeah, Haitians. Yeah, negative. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it, it became it kind of became ridiculous by using that example. What, uh, yeah, but but I think the overall economic sentiment, the border sentiment, I think those are very important. Uh, I mean, you mentioned DFW. I would say that yeah, Hoffman County, which is surprisingly is outside the of the city, outside of the city of Dallas. So it's actually a rural county. Uh, but one thing I wanted to add, you know, since we're doing kind of a election commentary too, uh, maybe this was an election of moral panics too. I don't know the usage uh, usage of moral panics, you know, and a variety of divisive issues. Uh, like you, you mentioned the uh, cat and dog eating uh, uh, example, then the transgender athlete, all these moral panics that may have benefited. I don't know the conservative swing vote because it's often culture wars that seem to divide uh the electorate and i don't know but then again you said inflation so it was economic you know concerns uh and then also the incumbent you know biden is the incumbent and uh vice president harris is considered the incumbent and then again the republican line was to make sure that the voter kept he hearing this that uh harris was the incumbent you know um <laughs> uh, so yeah those are just some side commentary but do you agree with moral panics i mean it was like a lot of moral panic stuff you know <laughs> that you, you kind of heard often in the uh election campaigns for instance if you watch the videos and all that i had to watch a lot of the videos that were aired in texas uh not just senatorial Ted Cruz uh, uh, campaign, uh, but also the presidential campaign. There was a lots of moral panic rhetoric, you know, that was used. Uh, yeah, throughout. I mean, and it's a question of like how credible it was. I think that, uh, you know, Harris, you know, the way how she started the campaign where she said, you know, this is a campaign of joy, um, which uh, is, is, is not good news if your life is not joyful, right? So, if you say that you're suffering from like higher prices uh, or let's say, you know, if you had to compete for resources with migrants or something like that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, then you, you kind of become more receptive to the other party. Uh, and then, and then Harris did try to shift her rhetoric by, you know, accusing Trump of fascism. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, which yeah. all you know, it, which like it also it, it only works among the people who already converted, right? So I'm sure, like, if she gave a speech in front of a college campus, I think it would be quite effective. But uh, yeah, uh, but, but, yeah. but uh, you know, not, not the uh, uh, college educated, yeah, college That's educated. Right. Uh, I did make a few notes. If I if you want me to share them, I I was asking actually asking some of my close friends both conservative and liberal uh, conservatives. Now, this is in Texas, you know. I don't know how representative the sample is, but I uh, was listening to some of the arguments. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, uh, some of my Democratic friends that live here in uh, Dallas County. And, you know, one of the failures of the Harris campaign, uh, one of the arguments was made maybe uh, not recognizing the grievances that young white male voters may have had that there was that reflected in the you know many white male voters voted for trump and they could feel an outlet an outlet where they you know like almost like a protest vote you know that burn it down kind of idea uh where 
yeah, maybe it, it was partly a fail failure of the Harris campaign to recognize the uh, uh, again that demographic. That was one argument. I don't know uh, if you want to go any further with that. Also, um, the success of the right wing media apparatus in shaping the narratives, you know, and major discourses. And maybe maybe the liberal media or liberal, let's say, outlets didn't have a chance in an environment which was heavily in favor of uh, a more of a right wing narrative. You know, the emphasis on immigrants and immigrants and transgender athlete topics and all this would circulate more. I don't know. I, I don't know. We'd have to research that. You know, I'm not a media expert, but it might be interesting to figure out if that's uh, people feed off of media narratives and agenda setting you know uh i don't know what do you think about that larry <laughs> do you think that's just the first two points the disgruntled white male voter in the uh uh right-wing media apparatus that had an advantage do you think that's a yeah so on the disgruntled uh men i think uh th th there's definitely uh something to it right i mean you know we have to pay attention to that because you know we teach in a college and university environment and you know one of the issues that we are experiencing more and more is that colleges you know skew more and more female right so you know we have a lot of young men that don't see any benefit uh, going to college um and then they're also not involved in these kinds of you know progressive discourses you know regarding you know transgender and abortion yeah. rights and so forth um and uh and i think they they could become uh, susceptible to uh to 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 the trumpist message of um you know you know we're going to have you know strong men again and you know we're going to have a restoration of you know working class jobs um but yeah, but i I'm, I'm not sure because if you look at like for instance manufacturing spending right so like the Kind of the factor that would go behind, like you know, a resurgence of male employment. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually increased under the Biden administration, right? Because you right. know, you get the Chips good. Act. Good economic, yeah. Good, good economy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you had the public investments. You know, like mm -hmm. the government was making those investments. You know, Trump in his first term talked a lot about infrastructure projects, but uh, but he's never done much of it. Um, like his big, biggest signature policy was the uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which was largely a tax giveaway to you know rich people for the most part. Uh, it, it wasn't really an investment laden agenda. So, uh, so I believe that there's a lot of uh, you know false advertising that comes with uh, Trumpist agenda, uh, and I'm not sure how he's going to make it different in the second term. Right. Uh, he will. He he will have a trifecta. I mean, he's he's gonna control the Senate and the House, mm -hmm. and uh, you know if he, you know, listens to kind of the more populist wing within this party, including his vice president J.D. Vance, maybe uh, there could be more you know uh, uh, st stimulating uh, employment policies that could uh, you know benefits um, you know the, the the young male electorate. Uh, then the, uh, on on the media side of things, uh, I, yeah. I would agree that uh, you know the media is changing. Uh, I believe that uh, Harris made a mistake by not showing up on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast. Right. Okay. Um, because you know R Rogan is um, uh, I mean, like he he was. Like the mainstream media tried to defame him, uh, obviously during COVID. Uh, like you know, he was a guy who was taking the horse to warmer, right? Um, and you know, this was not, you know, like they didn't say it because they really believed it, right? They they were saying it because, by day I mean like CNN and uh, MSNBC and the mainstream media, uh, they were saying it because they were envious, right? Um, because I mean, if you look at the uh, the viewership, uh, Rogan has many more listeners and viewers than uh, CNN or any of the mainstream uh, news stations, including Fox News, have. Yeah. Reaches uh, a large audience, right? 
Yeah. So, I mean, look, if you if you are competing in a democratic election, right, small new democratic election, you 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 want to show up uh, anywhere where you have the largest audience, right? Um, and clearly, you know, to the extent that, you know, like the graph that I showed earlier, right, the sixty five plus, yeah, shifting to its Harris. You know, if you look at the core demographics of the CNN, uh, MSNBC, and the Fox News uh, viewers, right. uh, it is specifically that category of uh, of the baby boomers, the sixty five right. plus. Um, they they are the ones who are still incredibly loyal to these TV stations, um, and you know, if you're only watching those, you know, yeah, you would have the impression that. Uh, Kamala Harris was going to win the election in a landslide, uh, and it did turn out for her, as you can see here. Um, mm -hmm. But it's uh, clearly not enough uh, to to, yeah. to win. The election. Just a thought experiment. I don't know if this is you know relevant, but the sixty-five year or older, you think it has to do with the social security? Uh, you know that uh, they really are dependent uh, on the having social security. You know. Payments paid, and the younger ones don't know. They're not even sure, you know, about retirement prospects. So they uh, uh, don't see, you know, the benefit of voting Democratic because of this whole, you know, predicting Social Security as a, you know, system in the future, or that's this that uh, the next generations, uh, you know, are are, are are in between political parties. We can't really put them in either camp. That they're still spontaneous and they can may swing in in other direction. I mean, and this right right now indicates they're they're going to the right. There's no question there. But I wonder if they get older, you know, if then well, so Social Security is important. That's the only way how I can understand interpret, for my opinion at least, the 65 year olds shifting democratic. Because I'm thinking of Social Security, you know, and uh, as a, as an institution. Uh, and elderly also having a vested interest in uh, maintaining the social security. But then again, I could be wrong. I'm just speculating. And the young are in this, you know, uh, unpredictable, unsecure, precarious future. And I don't know if they think by voting Trump that somehow they play in their favor. I don't know. But then again, we, we don't know. We're just making speculation now. <laughs> well, there is <laughs> indeed a widespread belief that, Trump is going to be better for the economy than the Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, indeed, I mean, if you look at the uh, stock market, it has been rallying uh, in the early days of after Trump yeah. won. Uh, but but you have to notice that the stock market is up also since 2020. So, you know, the Biden administration, the S&P 500 was doing incredibly well. Now, the, the issue, you know, with like the S&P 500 is that, you know, it's not the you know, average paycheck, right? You know, the average paycheck, I mean, has been decimated by inflation. Uh, now, the, now the if you look at the last year, right, since 23, I mean, we are seeing real wage increases. So I think that people are making up those losses uh, that they made uh, coming out of the pandemic uh, from the inflation. Uh, but uh, it's kind of a gradual process. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and people... You know, still harbor this kind of resentment uh, against the incumbent Biden administration, uh, blaming right. them for the you know high wave of inflation. Easy scapegoat, uh, right? Easy scapegoat. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let me just make another yeah. sociological remark. Yeah. About the electorate uh, shown in this graph, also Financial Times. So here we can see the Democratic versus the Republican vote margins. Uh, by the uh, income uh, groups, right? So the poorest one third. So if you take, you know, the poorest person to let's say the thirty third percentile, right? The middle third, which goes up to the sixty sixth, and then the richest, um, uh, you know, t t t people. So three bins, uh, and you can see that the narrative that the Democrats. Uh, are the party of the working class of the poor people? Fine. It was in the big in the eighties um, and nineties. Yeah, yeah, eighties, nineties, two thousands, up until yeah. probably like in the middle of the Obama administration. I want to say. Okay. And 
you know, and, and then the, you know, the Republicans were always the party of the rich people, right? Uh -huh. uh, which you can definitely see. I mean, certainly under, um, well, I mean, maybe it started kind of under Nixon, right? Kind of this silent majority argument, right? Uh -huh. Which was basically, you know, assuaging, you know, like wealthy white people uh, of like, you know, not losing too much despite uh, civil rights expansion and things like that. Uh, but uh, but then they became a very solid block under Ronald Reagan in the eighties, right? Um, and they still stayed this way um, throughout the um, the the two thousands, um, and even like under you know Mitt Romney, you know twenty twelve, I want to say, right? Uh, it was still that way, and I think the Trump effect. I mean, he's been on the ballot three times in a row, mm -hmm. and every single time, you know his his margins. Um, was you know deteriorating oh. among the wealthy. Oh. It was improving among the poor. Right. And so now it appears to be the case that 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 Trump is doing a better job of representing the working class, just in terms of the votes, right? I mean, we can make the argument about you know he's going to sell them out again, like you know, the, the the new Trump tariffs or a ma major oh. tax increase. It's, you know, you, you think that's do you think that's associated also with those two uh, events, him at a McDonald's and the other him driving a garbage truck? Do you think he was trying to appeal as like a, as a populist message? I'm I'm for the little person. I'm for the little people. You know, and uh, you you're you're my group. You think that's partly also a political communication strategy? You know the. Like this whole idea of working inside of McDonald's uh, and uh, uh, you know working the French fry, uh, yeah. Second, and then the other one was I think a garbage truck. He had a, a garbage had a truck vest, yeah. vest on. It reminds me so much of uh, Undercover Boss. You know, there's these uh, movie uh, or reality TV shows that promote this idea that the boss is undercover and they want to get a real feel of how it is in the real economy. You know, with workers and how things are and uh that that message may have worked maybe i don't know and uh at least when you look at the numbers or or just a you know uh a reversal of uh, democratic voters that uh are disconnected with the uh i don't know the democratic message which is not so working class oriented anymore maybe uh since yeah uh, with exception to maybe i don't know uh the labor vote but I don't know. It's all up for interpretation, right? That's why they, what we're trying to read into this. But but another 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 uh, you know, talking point, uh, the fact that we have a two party system in the United States that everything is always so polarizing and uh, that we don't have you know a third party to measure that these things happen that they converge and there's a kind of. <laughs> overlapping of one party entering a terrain of another political parties. Uh, I don't know. That's the only other explanation I can think of because, you know, in Europe that you would at least have a third party or something that you can reference uh, that maybe they're not getting to the, the center, you know, or they're not getting to the uh, business group or something. But with two parties, I think it's harder because then you have to look at demographics and then you're just looking at the trend of change of democratic voters you know, declining and or Republican voters increasing or something. You know? yeah, so on, on this issue of like the publicity stunt, uh, yeah. I think that, uh, you know, Trump did a good job on that, quite frankly, um, especially the, the garbage truck one, which was in response to, you know, kind of like a, you know, Biden comment, right? Oh, yeah, where, I remember that. Uh, where he was, you know, kind of trying to, you know, present the uh the, the Trump base as being you know trash right um and uh and, and then in direct response to that then that's when he Trump gets in the garbage truck uh, in terms of publicity I think you know this is this is the right stunt to pull but again you know like there's a big difference between you know I can appeal to the working class people versus you know my policies are benefit the working class, right? The actual policy, yeah. 
governance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when it comes to actual policy, I mean, I think we do have to go back to Bernie Sanders. Um, mm. and, and, and I mean, and Bernie Sanders. I mean, you notice, like, so the last two cycles, I mean, he was running, right? He, he ran against Clinton, he lost. He ran against Biden, he lost. Um, each time because the Democratic Party establishment, you know, wanted to uh, hold a tight grip over the you know election process. And um, so, but this time around, because, you know, Bernie didn't run, right? So, uh, and then and what happens is that the Democratic Party establishment then uh, also believes that, you know, they don't really have to do anything to uh, please kind of the Bernie wing of the party, right? So they were very self-restrained regarding, you know, populists, you know, left-wing populist messaging, right? Uh, and in fact, I mean, if you look what Harris did, you know, was the opposite, right? So she went to uh, Liz Cheney uh, and she, yeah. you know, did an event with her. Picking uh, out moderate Republican vote, yeah. Yeah, but then actually, I mean, if you look at the vote margins, I mean, like, I think only like 5 6% of the Republican voters uh, went for Kamala Harris, um, which is not a larger margin than, you know, four years ago. So uh, clearly the strategy doesn't work. I mean, if you look at the most of the, you know, the Trump base, I mean, it's more accurate to call them the Trump base rather than just the Republican base. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they would consider um, Liz Cheney to be part of the swamp, you know, like the, 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 the part of the corrupt political system yeah. uh, that that should be opposed. And uh, so, 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 it, so it was clear that like, her endorsement for Harris wasn't going to make any difference, right? I think in the conservative camp, it's called Ryan. So I think that's what the word is. Sort of a false, you know, conservative or something. Uh, the term, that's what the term is used. Uh, I've heard it before. <laughs> so rhinos or something. Rhino, uh, okay. The, yeah. yeah, just now you know, extra, extra free sushi. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, let's keep going. Let's, and and, and, and what, what, was the, what was the second point that you uh, mentioned? Mm -hmm. Uh uh, I've, you know the two-party system. I mean, it, it two pulls together or converges. I mean, uh, the two-party system is like I, I would characterize an example of American exceptionalism. Uh, now it's not, not to say in different countries they don't have the winner, uh, what first past the post system. You know, in other countries we got proportional, you know, representation. You got multiple parties. You and I know this. I mean. Again, that could be a positive or a negative thing. I mean, uh, you have a majority, you know, then you immediately know which which government is going to form. Uh, that's not the case in Germany. You know, you have multiple coalitions that have to be glued together, you know. But maybe the, the two-party system in the U.S., it always is, 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 is situated on two, you know, that it always swings and you don't really quite know. I mean... Is it just because they're satisfied with the party, you know, or the, is it just a, a, a swing of attitudes? Too many variables, you know, but with the proportional system, you can sometimes see it. I mean, the, the Greens get higher percentage of youth voters or the a a AFD, you know, the Populist Party gets a higher percent. Um, and that, even in the U.S., I mean, they have Libertarian Party, you know, they have... But they are so irrelevant because of the the two party system that you, the voters, you know, well, they did have Green Party, Jill Stein. There were some uh, people that voted uh, for her, but again, it's a two party system, which means it's uh, very polarized, and it polarizes the electorate too, I guess. Yeah. So if you see. wanted to analyze the yeah. the two third parties in the U.S. Uh, yeah. election for for this season, I mean, we know that. Uh, Jill Stein uh, was certainly a factor, uh, and, and also uh, RFK, uh, who actually mm -hmm. dropped out, but he actually received a similar amount of votes as uh, as Jill Stein of the Green Party. Single digits, yeah, single, low single digits, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, um, so I, I would say that like there's always a Democratic establishment argument that like the Green Party should drop oh, out yeah. because uh because they're going to lower the democratic margins in the swing states and that will help trump win and then the green party will never become president anyway yeah. um and you know now i mean if you look at the vote modules it's a very hard case to make because because in many uh counties and many states 
the amount of votes that the Green Party was getting this time was much smaller than the uh, than the Republican minus Democratic margin, right? Mm. Yeah, we, 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 you know, um, and, and significantly smaller. So, so I'm not sure whether mm -hmm. Stein this time was the decisive factor in the same way it was in 2016. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then for RFK, I mean, what's very interesting is that you know it, it was clearly the case that I mean he was running in orders for him to get on the graces of trump because mm -hmm. uh, you know if he had not run then like kind of his you know uh political agenda would have been somewhat marginalized right this make america healthy again right this kind of agenda mm -hmm. uh and uh yeah so he wanted to run on that issue and you know he saw the in the polls that he wasn't going to make it so uh now it's going to be a big question whether rfk is going to play a big role within the Trump administration um, because in the victory speech, he said, yeah, you know, we're going to, you know, put you in charge of the, uh, the American healthcare system, which is a giant behemoth. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, there are certain issues that, you know, need to be addressed. I'm not, I'm not too sure regarding the vaccine issue, but certainly with regard to like chronic diseases, you know, general public health, uh, the food supply, right, uh, definitely has to be cleaned up, right? You know, all of these neurotoxins and, you know, food dyes uh, that, that we add to the uh, diet. Food supply, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, th th those things, I mean, they definitely have to be, uh, you know, cleaned up. And, of course, you know, the, the research process, right, you know, like they, you know, like what what kinds of, you know, food dietary research or, you know, pharmaceutical research, uh, gets funded by the government, you know, what is the kind of revolving door situation for, you know, uh, government scientists that, you know, quit the government job and then they work for like a much the higher corporate, salary. Yeah, they jump right into the corporate sector. Yeah, In the corporate sector. And of course, they do very light touch regulation because they don't want to offend the future bosses, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't mean to interrupt you. By the way, there's a great documentary. Was it Food Incorporated? Uh, uh, there's uh, several documentaries that sometimes make this issue of, you know, the industrial agriculture and uh, genetically modified foods. But uh, over the years, uh, sometimes uh, I, I watch it too. But Food Incorporated, that was a good little documentary. But I think Food Incorporated 2 just came out. So just for the listeners, uh, and for you too, Larry, I don't know if you ever watched it. <laughs> it's good. It uh, has a critical view. You never heard of it? Food Incorporated. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of, you know, looking at the whole process of production and like you're saying, uh, commercialized, industrialized agriculture, you know, you have uh, chemicals and uh, how it's produced and yeah, all sorts of concerns, you know. Which uh, even with the recent what a E. coli outbreak uh, they had a few uh, months ago uh, with with the hamburgers, with no it was tied to onions, apparently coming onions out of and McDonald's. Yeah, that it, I think it killed a few people. I don't know. I have to check my sources, but it did make a lot of people sick. So yeah, the food supply was often concerns about the production and the safety standards, and yeah, E. coli things like that. Yeah, so I, so I think on the health agenda, I mean, I think that, that a lot has to be done. I mean, like the statistic that just came out was that 38% of the teenagers in America uh, have prediabetes, um, which uh, is a very terrifying figure um, because you know, it's like the inability to, you know, metabolize sugar effectively because you, uh, because the kids were consuming too much of it, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you then you look at the, you know, USDA dietary guidelines, which then determine, you know, what they receive in the school lunches, right? Yeah. Um, where, I mean, it's interesting if you go to the social media side of the USDA, they were only showing, oh, you know, we're giving these kids, you know, fruits and vegetables and look at how healthy it is. But, I mean, I remember when I was in high school, I mean, um, the healthiest thing probably was like, you know, the the, the wrap or 
the hoagie, the sandwich, right? Everything um, else is horrible, yeah. Yeah, I mean the restaurant. I mean, there's like the, the 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 pizza, right? You know, there was pizza every day. Um, there was another line for, um, the chicken nuggets, right? Yeah. Um, horrible, horrible stuff. Yeah, uh, I have and, I have I have similar images when I went to high school in Texas. I know exactly what you're talking about. But the oh, uh, in the south, it's even the higher risk. Uh, I think it's even worse in southern states. Uh, I I looked at obesity statistics among children. It is it is very, very bad in the South. Uh, dietary, like you said, dietary, definitely. And uh, also poverty. I think there's some correlation with poverty and uh, food insecurity or food deserts, you know. Food uh, deserts, that's right, yeah. Yeah, just a uh, lack of access. I was surprised. I mean, sometimes when I go to a food store, the lack of available uh, apples and, like, vegetables – Everything's processed, you know, everything is kind of made to throw away or if it doesn't sell, we don't offer it. When I used to go as a young like kid in Germany uh, into a, a store, you would have a variety of apples and apples would just be nutritious. And But now it's difficult. I don't know. I, I just don't have access to the like edible, good, delicious apples. And I don't know if there's a disconnect between, you know, the agriculture cultural sector and it's it's not profitable enough and they're throwing it away too much of it so everything you get is pre-packaged you know you got the packaged salad and the packaged carrots you know yeah so i mean like, I was, yeah, go whole, ahead. whole food scene tends to be like low margin products right yeah. so um you know you, you don't see a lot of advertisement for you know broccoli or ribeye steaks right even though you know those would probably be close to the top in terms of nutritional value. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, so you don't see a lot of marketing. Uh, and then and then generally, I mean, you can sell them still for profit at a store like Whole Foods, right? Uh, or even at Aldi's. Um, yeah. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, they, they're not uh, as profitable generally. And so... It's you know, the food offered. companies are not trying to supply low-income people uh, with those uh, fresh foods. Um, and, and then, but but this, there's still a way how to be uh, healthy. Uh, it's going to be more difficult if you live in a low-income neighborhood. Um, but um, yeah, so, but generally, like if you're able to get in the grocery store, you know, if you get like canned meat, like sardines, um, yeah, Bologna. Um, uh, you know, yeah, there, there's, there's ways. I mean, yeah, I've been sausages. Uh, there's ways how you can uh, survive um, with you know decent uh, nutrition, but but that's why I think the public information is very important too, right? Yeah. Uh, where because you know my worry is that like you know the mainstream kind of tells you that well you know you should be eating. You know, like the Mediterranean diet, you should be focusing fruits, vegetables, um, but uh, and the grains, uh, and and I'm I'm a little bit worried that like, you know, that it it it's not going to help uh, solve a lot of these like health issues, right? Uh, I think, you know, yeah. we we have to go back to ancestral diet, which is you know more in the animal fat direction. Uh, so yeah. So in short, not to interrupt you, in short. Do you think when Trump went to that McDonald's, it sends a wrong health message? Because you know? it, uh, again, I'm not trying to get political, but like the fact that it is McDonald's, you know, is a major corporation, you know, with uh, no, enormous amount of franchises and, uh, uh, you know, that uh, just the image of it and then now the branding of it in political discourse that people, oh, McDonald's, you know, the politician went there and, and a free advertisement pretty much that that company received right a corporation received but like if you would have went to a health food store you know how would have the narrative changed uh, it, uh which sometimes with german politicians you know especially green party uh they're often accused of being too healthy oriented they're too vegetarian you know and so even food can be political you know food can be uh used uh uh I don't know if I haven't seen that, but in the U.S., I get this impression that there's a culture war sometimes around food, but not like in Europe. Europe is like diet should be neutral. You know, healthy diet should be not political. 
that we all need nutritious meals, you know, uh, as for our health. Uh, yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know where I'm going with this, but but yeah, I think mean, about so McDonald's. I mean, it's <laughs> it's very problematic for the most part because yeah. most of uh, the yeah. ingredients in the McDonald's um, are eventually going to make you sick, right? So if you eat uh, tons of French fries, uh, which already you know is kind of carb heavy. Uh, it is then deep fried in uh, seed oils. Uh, they they used to fry the French fries in uh, tallow, uh, which was, you know, I would say healthier, the healthier version. Uh, and then at some point they then realized that uh, seed oils, um, like you know, vegetable, corn, canola, soybean oil, is much cheaper, and uh, so. They switched out those oils, and so now you have, you know, very toxic oils. Um, the origin of the seed oils, uh, which was called the, the, the cotton seed oil in the early uh, 20th century, was that, that it was originally used as a lubricant oil for engines. Right now we're eating it. <laughs> yeah, now we're eating it uh, because oh, they wow. they found a way through a process of you know hydrogenation. You know, basically, very extensive chemical processing. Uh, they could take the rancid smell out of the the oil, and they could make it shelf stable. Uh, and then they realized, hey, you know, if you if you fry up food in it, uh, it's going to have these very nice, uh, you know, mouth texture features, right? Yeah. Um, but but uh, but but it's terrible for you, and you know, basically, the human body is about. You know, a hundred years of exposure to seed oils, uh, versus like you know, you look at like butter, cream, uh, tallow, and any kind of animal fat. We've been eating that for hundreds of thousands of years, right? Uh, it's probably mm -hmm. good for you. And and, and so, yeah. So, um, yeah, a lot of things come from McDonald's that is bad. However, if you were in a pinch, you know, you could go and yeah. order the a la carte menu. You just order the the beef burger patties. Uh, maybe you know a piece of lettuce, a piece of tomato, or something. Yeah. You know? Uh. Uh. And uh, and you'll probably have a very, very good and healthy meal. Uh. Right. Uh, but you just have to yeah. know that. Uh. That, that those options. Uh, exist. More information. Yeah. The consumer has more information. Yeah. Okay. I have one more graph. Uh, yeah. 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 We here. we drifted a little off topic, but we're good. We're good. <laughs> we're yeah. good. Uh, so, uh, wow, uh, so, so every governing party facing election uh, in, in a rich country has lost vote share the first time this has ever happened. So we know we know that this year, you know, twenty four has been like a major election year. Uh, there's a lot of countries like you know India has been going through it. Um, you know, France at the legislative election, UK. U.S. right, so many many countries have had elections, and you know we can see that, you know, if if we do the international comparison, you know, Kamala Harris didn't do so badly. I mean, she did lose uh, some of the vote share, uh, mm -hmm. but there's been other like governments that have been felt as a result of the elections this year. So, so there's a lot of discontent. I think that's going on around the world. Uh, there's a lot of political, geopolitical instability. There is, um, you know, basically inflation. I mean, that's oftentimes how it expresses itself because if you have some kind of war, you you might disrupt the supply chains. Um, you know, then then, you know, you know, people's uh, standard of living goes down. Um, you might have austerity programs, right? Uh, because you know the economy is doing worse, the government is collecting less taxes. And then they try to, you know, balance the budget on the backs of you know working class people. So you know, for various reasons, I think that you know many many incumbent governments were doing very poorly. And so I mean, if you imagine like if Trump had been in power right now, he would have right? been voted out, right? Yeah, he would have been voted out uh, by now, right? Um, because you know he would have been blamed for. The you know economic situation, and and he was blamed in the same way in twenty twenty if you remember right, mm -hmm. um you know people were, you know absolutely getting sick and tired of you know, like his you know comments about whatever, 
you know, or take ivermectin or whatever. I mean, like there, there were like so many like, you know, ridiculous comments that he was making and and people at that time they were still hurting, right? I mean, they were just gradually coming out. They were still in the middle of a lockdown, right? Uh, that was it was ongoing, right? Uh, so, uh, so people wanted to have, you know, a different figure, a more moderate figure, right? And Biden yeah. was. So I want to I want to read this again at the very top, so I make sure I understand it fully. Every governing party facing election in a developed country this year lost vote share. The first time this has ever ha happened, right? Um, so. Uh, that this is a unique situation is an exceptional situation where whatever the governing party is uh, will lose or will you know the opposition will win whatever the opposition will be. I'm wondering if you know I'm thinking sociologically now. I mean that issues have such a complexity to them, you know that the voters think uh, uh, let's just you know vote everybody out. And then maybe that solves the complexity of our issues. And then they, and then often maybe, I mean, maybe they think the political institutions can solve these complex issues, but it seems to be like, you know, like we're seeing here that the pattern is whatever happens, damned if you do, damned if you don't, the political system gets blamed for it, you know, or polit in this case, a political party uh, that is in office, which is quite unique. I don't know, uh, which... I don't know if it's just a, uh, the gap between, you know, what a state can do or uh, the, the governance policies or the gap of trying to solve very complex issues out there. You know, well, I mean, uh, solving uh, complex issues. I mean, if, if they did solve it, I think yeah. they, they would actually gain the vote share, right? Yeah. But uh, But I believe that many voters believe that that the governments are incapable of fixing their problems, mm. right? So there's this issue of, you know, the ungovernability uh, of a country, yeah. and um, and and I think more and more countries are being pushed in that direction of uh, to its ungovernability. Mm. Um, you know, if you look at, um, I, I was just recently reading the book by Jürgen Habermas, uh, which was oh, called the yeah. uh, legitimation crisis oh that's a classic that's a good one yeah yeah um yeah. and uh and it's kind of the yeah, 1973 it was a classic formulation for kind of uh yeah the frankfurt school perspective on yeah. you know, why modern capitalist countries uh, are um lo you know losing the legitimacy yeah. um and, and and essentially i mean you know, there are certain expectations that, you know, uh, that governments are building up, that the welfare states are building up, uh, and those expectations uh, cannot be met, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so you have, you have disgruntled voter base, then, yeah, dissatisfied, yeah. That's right, yeah. So, um, and uh, because I, I, I think the fundamental issue that you're gonna have to face in every capitalist system is that you know you have to grow the economy sufficiently uh and you have to provide enough resources uh to kind of you know the followers uh to your own voting base uh, and to the general electorate um and um and and and, and for some reason i mean like if the, if if you're not able to accomplish that objective then you're going to have zero sum politics you're gonna to have to start to uh, take things away from certain groups, certain people, and uh, uh, and and then in that way you're gonna bring people against you. Mm -hmm. Um, and even if uh, you know, because you know, like because the Biden administration has been saying that you know, look, the average incomes are going up now. You know, after dipping uh, in the first two years of his administration. Um, and it might be true at the average level, but but you know, look, the average. I mean, it also takes into account, 
you know the very rich people who invested uh in in, in the stock market right mm -hmm. or who invested in the real estate uh space right uh and, and they're basically making a killing right oh yeah um and so there, there are going to be some amount of people who are not necessarily destitute but they're just like treading water they they feel like well okay i'm 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 kind of losing my standing i'm losing my ground um and um uh, yeah, and yeah in, in, in ultimately like if you have too many people that feel like that they're losing their ground uh i think you know we're willing to vote for anybody <laughs> yeah they'll all they'll, well, they'll basically i mean look in a democratic system right i mean you're not mm -hmm. saying you know i vote for a good guy and i don't vote for a bad guy uh oftentimes the choice is between the bad guy who is in charge right now mm -hmm versus the bad guy who's in opposition right so you're always going to vote for the bad guy who's in opposition because you know because th th that's the way how you can show your discontent right um yeah. and, and and that's and, and i think that's kind of where we are right now right uh, yeah it's uh, kind of a challenging because uh it makes almost authoritarianism appealing you know <laughs> as an appealing second option and democracies are supposed to function on democratic principles and not a strong man, you know, a strong person supposedly puts a swing in the system, you know. Uh, yeah, so it's a it's a it's an uh, a risky, a risky thing. So this is this graph is shocking if you think about it. Well, it, it just means automatic uh, whatever the, the governing party is will lose. So I wonder what kind of continuity or discontinuity this creates uh or political systems you know because we used to yeah. think of continuity now it looks like discontinuity if it's just going to be the next party gets punished for whatever they do you know in election cycles that are only four years long you know yeah, yeah. and then and, and then and then you know the issue then becomes also like if you have you know like a like a ruling class that knows that they're going to be replaced in four years time yeah. Uh, you know, they might, you know, be less inclined to do good things for the electorate, right? You know, it might just be a corrupt cabal where they're just like, okay, we have four years to basically loot the store, right? Uh, yeah. um, like a bad car salesman, you know. Yeah. <laughs> take, and, take, and, take it, take it, take on everything they could, you know, and and you got a lemon <laughs> or you got a bad car. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's that, that's a possibility with the Trump two administration, right? Because I mean, right now, I mean, he knows that he's not going to run again, unless he changes the U.S. Constitution. Um. So, you know, and then he's and then he said, "Well, okay, there's a lot of people serving in the first administration that have denounced, you know, Trump. You know, they're part of the Never Trumper camp now." Yeah. Um. And these people are probably not going to get a position, um, but you know he might appoint, um, like you know other people that you know will feign their loyalty uh, towards Trump, um, and yeah, I mean, and, and you could say that you know the the system could yeah you know, become somewhat more you know corrupt, right? Yeah. Um and uh, and this is something that has to be considered, right? I mean, this is being quite quite problematic, obviously, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but those are good statistics you showed. I mean, it shows a, a shocking trend, yeah, of discontinuity and uh, chaos in the future. Well, I mean, it, we don't. That's the thing we're trying to predict political behavior, and it's a complex thing to analyze because there's so many different uh angles or the voters the institutions the state of the world economy geopolitical i mean global warming you know a variety of uh things and topics to consider which a lot of those we've discussed in previous podcasts but uh we're focusing on the u.s election uh, yeah so that's right little... so it's a big question like what is the future going to be um you know the trump two administration so i 
um like I, i'm obviously very interested in like you know uh the, the geopolitics you know because obviously that's what the you know the president of the united states will determine um i think that um you know the tariff policies are going to escalate probably further right and you know especially against chinese products but even against european and mexican and so forth and the issue then is okay well you're going to push up the cost of living and it's incredibly regressive right because you know if if the cost of you know the essentials you know double uh you know i don't really care if i'm a rich person but mm. i care very much if i'm a poorer person so um you know and uh, and but then he says well okay we're going to give tax breaks to to counteract the tariff rises the tariff rise could partially fund those tax cuts right But then the, the issue is, I mean, if you look at the, the Trump one era tax cuts, I mean, they were targeted at rich people, right? Because it is true that rich people pay most of the income tax because we have a progressive income tax system. Right. So if you're, you know, doing standard tax cuts, which they have done, uh, you're always going to give more money to rich people, right? Than you give to the poor. Mm. So, so basically, I mean, there's a possibility that, yeah, even though you know trump has made the republicans into you know a working class party by the vote by the vote shares you know he could still be you know selling out the working class voters um and um yeah and then also the immigration policy right where you know if if you look you know um the democrats did very well with hispanics historically right and You know, if you look at the uh, subgroups among the Hispanic the Latino grouping, I would say the Cubans became very pro-Trump, yeah. pro um, especially in Miami, right where they're located. Um, the men um, have become outright, you know, pro-Trump. I think mm -hmm. is a um, you know positive Republican margin of like at least ten points. I would say. Uh, the Latinas, uh, the women, they they still stuck with Harris, but at a smaller margin. Um, so, um, and then the issue is, well, okay, so what about this undocumented migrants? I mean, well, should these people be deported? Um, you know, it, it's a complex matter because you might say, well, on the one hand, if you're um, you know, his, his Hispanic American, but you're you know American citizen. You you're kind of like yeah I mean I I want the the illegals the undocumented to be you know getting at the back of the line you know basically you know be kicked out and uh, have less competition with with myself mm -hmm. but then at the, at the same time like if you have a lot of relatives that are undocumented It becomes personal yeah yeah so then then it becomes a big question it's like well do you do you want the you know uh the ICE the uh, enforcement agency you know do you want them to go hard you know against the people in your family that might be here you know in an undocumented way so is, is it, like that, so there's going to be some issues that will have to be you know uh fixated there um you know in terms of like what is the actual policy impact of like what I was voting for. I mean, am I still a net beneficiary of that uh, at the end of the Trump administration? Uh, you mean, uh, in other words, the actual consequences of now that the, the this is actually translated into, you know, political uh, reality. I mean, campaigning is one thing, but, you know, Trump gets voted, uh, he's voted in, he's a president, and now there is, mass deportation and he says there's no price tag the real you know usage of material power of physical power of border agents to really do this kind of work which will you know have enormous consequences for families and uh the actual physical detention you know how you're gonna uh, remove people uh, that way and enormous amounts of individuals i mean it's in the millions but the uh, yeah how this will be you know Uh, consequential for many families affected, you know. Uh, 
you know so yeah well because now now it goes from political campaign to you know like if it's as it becomes a government policy right to have a hard kind of immigration kind of uh, policy yeah yeah building so, fences so, so. building fences and such like that i mean building walls or using the military as a border patrol or something yeah like in texas for instance yeah and it's also quite interesting that like you know some of the liberal states i mean they already you know reawaken like the the sanctuary city sanctuary state kind of concept again right mm -hmm. uh and uh so i think in illinois and california they were talking about that uh but in new york city interestingly the the mayor said that he was going to cancel the like debit cards that were given to you know undocumented wow. migrants uh so i think that uh you know he, he's kind of uh switching over to you know a more you know restrictive perspective on on, on migration uh Republi he's republican though right the new york mayor right but new york mayor oh, is a democrat a... oh really democrat, okay yeah okay and and, well, and and he was also prosecuted for oh uh, corruption by the, by the D, by the doj um yeah if in texas there was also a dallas mayor that switched political parties uh, uh i think a year ago so mayors sometimes you know have that privilege of i guess they can just flip parties and <laughs> uh go whatever their vested interest is and make a political career you know in whatever administration offers people a job that's kind of sad with mayors though when you think about it like how easy it is to switch <laughs> and you get voted in you may get voted in you know as a democrat and then you just uh do whatever you want yeah <laughs> yeah it happened by the way in dallas in dallas this happened uh there was uh voted in uh eric johnson i believe yeah he was voted in as a dallas democratic mayor and then switched parties openly endorsed uh became republican um so yeah uh, that's just at the city level the major city level but quite interesting <laughs> yeah i mean municipal yeah. politics can you know swing yeah. in that direction yeah. um yeah yeah then there's this other concern i mean the red Darren Asimolu, one of the institutional economists, and he's very concerned about, you know, corruption and like quality of institutions where basically, I mean, you know, if let's say Trump appoints again his family members into you know, high level advisory positions, uh, you know, he's going to uh, open the door to, I don't know, like the Saudi crown prince uh, to basically you know, uh, whatever, bribe him personally or receive, uh, you know, U.S. state contracts or whatever. I mean, so there, there definitely is a risk uh, yeah. of, um, you know, some uncontrollable uh, corruption. Uh, but I mean, but look, I mean, we, we did survive the Trump one term, right? Uh, so... You know, it's like th there's a certain continuity within the U.S. state, and you know, so we have good chances that you know we can, you know, make it out uh, of the second Trump term. Uh, oh. Well, it's know. midterm. Midter midterms are in two years, so uh, <laughs> two yeah, years. So, yeah, you know, we have permanent <laughs> elections, obviously, in the U.S. system, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, my my guess is that like Trump will oversee like a major crisis you know whether it's financial or climate or pandemic or whatever i mean there's gonna be or geopolitics right there's gonna be some crisis and people will want to get rid of him after you know the end of his term anyway so mm -hmm. uh so you know, now he has like whatever two years to show you know what he's in for um on the foreign policy side i mean i i follow this ukraine war quite closely yeah, and uh, the Trump team has already unveiled, um, you know, his so-called peace plan. Uh, the idea is to, uh, to basically freeze the front line, right? So basically, wherever the Russian troops are stationed now, and the Ukrainian troops, uh, they're going to stay in place, and, uh, you know, Ukraine will not join NATO, but, but the Ukrainian territory will be patrolled by. 
European armies, interestingly, not NATO, so not not American army, but by the European armies. Um, mm -hmm. And but but those are NATO countries, so it's going to be quite like, a like like Poland and or Sweden or like uh, yeah, basically okay. yeah. So okay. I mean, th think of all of the European NATO countries, right? You so know, you they, could have German troops there. Yeah, you could yeah. have German troops uh, in, uh, you know, along the. Uh, eastern border of um, basically the Ukrainian controlled territories and um, and, and that's going to be very interesting because I mean firstly I mean I would have a very hard time believing right now that you know either the Ukrainian or the Russian government would agree to that format to that arrangement um, but, but if they did I think it would be a credible piece agreement because um well because the russians wouldn't be able to keep pushing forward i mean they would have to kill european soldiers not just ukrainian soldiers uh if you know if they wanted to you know have another run at kiev which is their intention all along so it would be a massive concession if the russians were to agree to the conditions of the uh, so-called trump peace plan uh do you think do you think the trump peace plan is a kind of appeasement strategy? Well, not if the European troops are stationed in Ukraine. Okay. Uh, so, because so, like the idea with a, like appeasement would be, you know, if you have the same proposal, right? Like the freezing of the front lines, you know, without any further guarantees, right? So, you know, Ukraine will not be part of NATO, and you know, you know, NATO troops will never be in in Ukraine, and and so forth. Uh, yeah, you know, that would genuinely be appeasement because it would it would effectively open the door uh, for mm -hmm. for the Russians to you know take the rest of Ukraine yeah. uh, upon their choosing, right? Uh, that, sure. that 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 would, that would be the worst kind of proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 then there's there's no way how I could see how the Ukrainian side would agree to that. Uh, of course not. No. No. <laughs> yeah, but but again, you know, so. But I I think it sounds like a credible peace plan. Now the issue is going to be, you know, getting, you know, do you well do you bringing the Ukrainians on your side is going to be easy because, well because because the U.S. does supply a lot of the financial and military aid to Ukraine, and so you know you you do have to, you know you you do have to listen to your benefactor right. Uh, but for the Russian side, it's going to be quite complex, right? Because, you know, it could be the case that Putin still believes that, you know, he can win this war outright. And, and as long as he... Is, uh, Trump. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, as long as he believes that, maybe he's like, well, I'm just going to keep pushing. I'm going to keep going. Uh, and then it's going to be quite interesting because, because Trump, I mean, he has... You know, he has like two figures that are sitting on his ears, Right. You know, you have the J.D. Vance, right, the vice president, who's basically saying that Ukraine is a European problem and the Americans should just, you know, cut their losses and get out of there ASAP. Uh, and then you have people like, you know, John Bolton, Mike Pompeo. I mean, people who are kind of far away, I would say, from the Trump orbit. But um, and also like, you know, a lot of the Republican senators, uh, you know, who... Like you know, uh, Mitch McConnell and people like that, uh, who, who oh, say Ukraine, that, yeah, yeah we, we we say that actually, you know, we have to deliver more aid to Ukraine effectively. Mm -hmm. Uh, so so you're gonna have like these two voices in his head, and you know, and, and the, the, depending on like, you know, whom that he finds more credible, uh, and listens to, uh, he's gonna react to that, right? Mm -hmm. Uh. And and so I mean you can say in foreign policy I mean you have this theorem which is called you know the madman theory of politics right mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I always pick the example of like you know North Korea right like where in one moment you know Trump called him the rocket man right you know we're gonna rain fire and fury over him right uh, the next moment you know he gives him a hug uh, along the a demilitarized zone on the border, uh, North and South Korea. Photo op, right? 
Yeah, yeah it was a photo op, effectively. Mm-hmm. But 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 that's kind of the, you know, it, it would fit this kind of madman theory of politics view, mm-hmm. and 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 many of the countries in the world, you know, the Chinese, the Russian, the Iranian, but also the European leadership, uh, they I, I think they kind of like the the predictability of the U.S. administration, you know, under Biden and Obama and, and the other administrations. It's not a wild card. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. so there's this argument that actually, you know, having a madman in the White House is going to make the geopolitical yeah. tensions more manageable, not less. Uh, and, uh, oh, okay. And, 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 and so it, because it, like, it, it cannot be completely denied in the sense that then under Trump, I mean, a lot of the conflicts in the world, they were winding down, right? So, you know, there were attacks against, U.S. attacks against, you know, the Houthis and Syria, right? Um, you know, the, 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 the Afghanistan war was still ongoing, but there was a minimal troop presence. And, you know, with the Doha agreement, the U.S. actually pulled out of Afghanistan. So, um, now, but then there's other people who say, well, it was... The Afghanistan withdrawal, which was causing the the Ukraine war, because Putin realized that you know that the Americans were not gonna, uh, you know, we're not gonna mess around with other countries anymore. Yeah. And uh, and so then you create a power vacuum, obviously in Eastern Europe. Um. Yeah, it's hard to analyze these things because there's so many variables, there's so many possibilities, but, um. But yeah, I mean, it is true that at the end of the the, the Trump Warner administration, the geopolitics was um, not as bad as it is right now. I mean, that's pretty that's pretty clear, I would say. Because right now, I mean, we've got Eastern Europe, Ukraine, we've got Middle East, like Iran versus Israel. So well, we already I mean, have big problems. In the world. I mean, if if I if I'm trying to think it through, you know, sociologically, I guess I'm using that word sociologically carefully, the relative autonomy of different states and, you know, governments deciding what they do is autonomous. You don't know. It's spontaneous. uh, It's unpredictable. And it's just, I don't know how you could build a model to test. Maybe you could, I guess anything you can build a model, but it's a relative autonomy of of, uh, various actors that they can act how they want to act it's, and i don't know if it's you can blame it you know anyone can blame it on a political administration unless it's linked with with their policy that just causes more friction with countries or you know i guess that's what political scientists maybe they do research and they try to figure out the state of peace in the world i know the stockholm institute for peace and conflict they were trying to often look at patterns of peace and war and it, it's quite fascinating. I mean, I looked at some of their material and they try to link, for instance, uh, the rise of like military expenditures. You know, that could be a variable. And so when people have more military expenditures in countries, maybe they're preparing for war, you know. And Russia did spend the most, I think, in the uh, last two years. Uh, the second is Ukraine. Uh, uh, again, I have to look at the data, but that might be interesting. You know that there is there is a material uh, connection that we could look at peace and conflict in the world, and uh, how much are states spending on the military? You know, and then what impact does that have on conflict? Um, but other than that, it's relative autonomy. I think mean, is every country, you know, that's what they do. <laughs> You know, and yeah, regardless the, regardless of U.S. policy or regardless of even EU policy, they do what they want to do. You know, uh, unless they get sanctioned or there's a penalty for their actions. Yeah, that's my my point of view. But that's the way I yeah, think. because I mean, you have like a messy world system, right? And then every country, you have like their own political elites, and they make their own decision as to, you know, what they want to do and. How much they want to drive the conflict? Uh, I mean, I was just reading something about the clashes between, you know, Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea, right? Uh, and then there's like this province which is wedged in in the northern part of uh, Ethiopia, which is called Tigray, hmm. and they've been having these 
you know, basically on and off political conflicts, uh, military conflicts, you know, uh, you know, lots of innocent civilians died as a result of it, right? There's humanitarian crisis, right? Lack of food and things like that. Uh, and uh, it's really ironic because, you know, the, the guy who is partly behind all of that, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the prime minister of Ethiopia, uh, Abiy Ahmed, um, he received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019 oh, wow. uh, because he uh, signed a peace agreement with the Eritrean leadership at that time. And and it's actually ironic that now that he's still leading the same government, uh, you know, he has you know mobilized many, you know, Ethiopian soldiers uh, to clash against uh, the Tigrayans and later the Eritreans. So actually, they're getting back to like a warlike status again, uh, and which is just completely, you know, undermining this intent behind the Nobel Peace Prize, right? Uh, that was Machiavellian, no? <laughs> Very Machiavellian, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what is the meaning behind the Nobel Peace Prize, effectively, right? I was looking in the back of my bookshelf, and there's once a book that I had. Um, it was an Italian. Let me see. Let me check real quick if I can find it. Uh, no, that's not it. But it, it, it goes in this world system direction. Uh, he was an Italian sociologist, uh, Giovanni something. But he, he kind of goes in this direction of uh, Immanuel Wallerstein, world systems theory, you know, the core, semi-periphery, periphery. But uh, he kind of goes in this direction of the social chaos in the world system, that the world system is very fragile, you know, and unpredictable. And there's a constant power shift you know, between re different regions of the world. It's very different from the, what was it, Samuel P. Huntington's, uh, Huntington's book, The Clash of Civilizations. I don't know if you ever read that one. Yeah, and I read that it, one. Yeah. It's a kind of, you know, it's a clash of cultures. There's a dividing line between different religious uh, regions of the world. And then there's secular regions of the world. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a real conflict based on culture, cultural differences. But like, I don't know. There's different ways of looking at it, I guess. I'm kind of still, I'm still uh, influenced by the work of uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein. I still think that there is an increasing competition between the global north and the global south, and it's it's revealed with you know asymmetry of development and all of these issues like global climate change and uh, coups. I think there's something there with the world system being very unequal and resource allocation is very unequal that it creates uh, conflict around the world. Um, you know, that, that makes sense. I mean, that would make sense as a theoretical lens, but of course things are more much complex. I mean, you have to, we can go on, uh, especially the international system is very complex. And I I would have to be a regionalist. I have to I would have to know the region of the, the country. You probably have better background information than I have, uh, Larry. But because uh, everybody would have to know exactly the region, the, the details, and the political system, and the culture, you know, and the history and, uh, of the region, you know, whatever region we focus on. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you know, you could say that. Uh... You could become an anthropologist almost. You don't have to study everything. Yeah, I mean, so there's yeah. the de there's the details, right? And then there's kind of like the big picture, right? Yeah. You know, the the big picture. I think it goes back to this. Yeah, Wallerstein would would be one, and then Arigi is yeah. another guy. It's the guys. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's all, yeah, yeah, it's it's always about like the the hegemonic power, right? So there's going to yeah. be two countries. Yeah, this that sit at the top of the global hierarchy of the world system and uh yeah go ahead and, and, and they are the ones that you know you could say uh decide on like the financial flows uh in the global yeah. economy uh you know where you know uh investments are happening and so forth they are just organizing the global economy right uh yeah. by you know a allowing for you know trading um open trade um yeah. and uh 
but but uh but and then the smaller countries within it you know they try to you know make the best of it right they try to you know uh find some kind of trading regime right that they can integrate into uh and oftentimes you know because they only export uh primary commodities yeah. uh so therefore you know they're not going to be able to gain a lot of the foreign exchange uh they also don't have you know stable institutions you know rule of law and uh and so they have a very hard time accumulating capital uh in their own country uh you know they cannot develop good schools and hospitals and infrastructure and so forth and uh yeah so then basically uh you know and if you have an economy that's like built on rent seeking right basically it's owning the flow of these resources right and then able to you know basically extract rents from that uh yeah. you know it, 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 that's going to create conflicts right you know yeah or land rents. grabbing land grabbing and private equity and <laughs> yeah definitely different types of conflicts yeah with, and, and so yeah. that's where the migration issue is so important right because okay. i think that you know migration is kind of like a way to you know release the pressure wealth right uh i yeah I'm, I'm i don't want to interrupt you i still have this book that i really world risk society by all respect i love the 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 title of it you know you got to have the metaphor you know i always thought world risk society that makes sense to me you know of course that was a, a continuation of uh, the book risk society that he wrote in 80, 1986 but now world risk society that really starts to make sense uh uh so we uh, as social you know social scientists or like uh social i guess thinkers we have to find the right metaphor the right language to describe what we're talking about right um so i think it it does it <laughs> Right. Yeah, but, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. like the world, the world risks. I mean, I think, yeah. I think it's going to stay with us, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think that the risks are multiplying and increasing. Um, uh, you know, it's, we just mentioned migration and the, the low legitimacy that it causes among, you know, rich country governments. Um, then, you know, an, an, another another risk you could say. So th there's this argument about like overpopulation, uh, but I think. Now, you know this kind of like you know it, it was a very strong discourse in the nineteen sixties and seventies. Um, you know limits to growth, uh, but mm -hmm. but I, I I think now there's very few people who make this argument at this point because if you look at the uh, fertility data that was brought out in you know Europe and North America, South America, East Asia. Uh, in nearly every place, well, in every place you're seeing a decline in fertility rate. Fertility when I, down. you know, when I, when I checked out the Latin American numbers, I mean, it was like, I think in Chile it was like one point two or something, right? Um, really? Huh. Yeah, it, it was it was very very low. I was quite struck by that. It's a Catholic country too, right? Yeah, yeah. For much, okay. Yeah, Check so. It. So you have many countries where you see a massive fertility decline. Um, I I I think that you know. So therefore, I think that the main issue of like, oh, you know, we're not going to be able to feed these people or sustain these people. I think that the Malthusian be, argument. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I think the Malthusian argument is going to be pushed down further and further. I mean, I think the the, the, the discourse that we have in the Western countries, uh, certainly in East Asia, um, is that. It, it, it is that you know the, the, the you have shrinking societies right you have aging societies you know you're gonna have uh massive labor shortages um mm. and uh you think it's hyped yeah <laughs> yeah so i mean like yeah. in germany right the discourse is Fachkräftemangel, right which is yeah. you know the the kind of skill labor shortage uh yeah. is what they call it um and so and and and, and that becomes more and more acute right because you have because you have aging right i mean you have the you know much smaller cohorts uh, that were born after 1980 
Yeah. Uh, and uh, and we're going to start noticing that. I mean, you going to are you going to be closing down schools? Are you going to open You know, up? that's school shutting down. That's a big uh, concern even throughout the South here. Uh, even elementary schools have seen a shrinkage of enrollment and it's causing issues of, uh, yeah, schools being closed or, uh, yeah, worries. Of course, there's other issues too, you know, de uh, budgeting and lack of funding, but like there's an issue of enrollment of the students, uh, you know, this, this lack of births. <laughs> So, yeah, people have bigger families. People just are not having such huge families anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Single so, yeah, people. Yeah, that 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 that's a huge issue, right? Uh where, you know, I mean, I call this kind of like you know, the individualization of society ultimately. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, you know, which, you know, Durkheim called this anomie and I mean, if you remember You know, enemy. I mean, he considered it to be the bane of society. It's the destruction of society, effectively, right? Mm -hmm. um, because you know, who, you know, what is a human if not, you know, a, a social animal, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and 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 in this, and, and if we implant this idea, in, you know, in people's head that well, you know, you can be, you know, complete liberated individuals. You know, you don't have any. you know, social obligations at all. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't have any offspring, right? So, uh, so, so, so you know, there's, there's this kind of broader sense that, you know, well, people don't have to reproduce anymore, right? And then, uh, but from a societal level, I mean, it is kind of necessary to do it. I mean, if you want to maintain the society as we have it today, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is... certainly a big challenge um and uh yeah and and, and and look i mean is from sociology history i mean like we don't really have a blueprint for increasing fertility um because you know we because we we never had like industrialization right yeah industrialization and 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 the consequences of that right Don't, but don't you think that the idea of a welfare state was to try to remedy uh, the impact of market forces that at least in Britain, you know, in Germany, after World War II, the idea was welfare state could, you know, create a social safety net to where people are still able to have families and there's child support and there's uh, Yeah, well, and actually, public. the the welfare state is going to exacerbate the trends in the direction of individualization, right? Okay. Because 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 now I mean it's like okay, I I don't need my kids to take care of me, but I need Mm -hmm. the state to do that, right? So the state Yeah. is going to pay me the pension, um, and so I mean, right? I mean, so you know, my my father is retired, for instance. I mean, you know, he gets. government benefits and uh you know which i i suppose i mean it's good for me because you know i don't have to support him financially as much so um but 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 then you know like the flip side of it obviously is you know you're gonna have more of this trend to its individualization right Okay. An adverse, ne unintended consequence, you know. yeah and then individualization i mean it always means that okay well you know i i i'm, I'm not obligated to have children right Because I mean, ultimately, like pro procreation. Still voluntary. It's still voluntary, I guess, yeah. Yeah, I mean, procreation. <laughs> You'll be getting it. Ultimately, it's it is a social social obligation, right? You you you're creating that obligation because you know you have a uh, you know vulnerable, defenseless child that uh, you know has to be raised by somebody, right? So, um, Mm, interesting. yeah. So, so that so the welfare state. I mean. It's um you know of course you have the argument by you know uh scholars like Jess Calarco right uh, she argues that Oh yeah, that one. The mother, a mother is a uh, yeah. What's the title of the book? Uh, I, I saw it. yeah Mother I, I is forgot a social. the title Mother is a social. Uh, women as a social safety net. I think, or yeah women a social safety net safe, and something so like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so her her argument is that you know you have to expand the welfare state like if 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 you want to encourage people to have kids, um you know then you cannot. You have to stop demonizing uh, mothers who, you know, are basically, 
you know, balancing the the load, right? With, you know, full-time job and the kids, right? And then the childcare. And so it's this constant, like, like having like multiple balls up in the air, which, you know, no person can endure that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she says as well, you know, you, you, if you want to childbirth, you actually have to have more of a welfare state. Um, but then, you know, I don't know. If, so if let, let's say if the U.S. were to Europeanize the welfare state, right? Mm, yeah. Like, you know, would we increase or decrease our fertility rate? Because you could make the argument that, I mean, the Americans are at 1.6. You know, the Europeans are at 1.4, I would say, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know what the numbers in Germany, Austria. I think it's just about like one point three or four or something, right? Um. So, and, and uh, yes, I mean, in Austria, the the child benefits are, you know, oh, it, 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 with the American comparison, I mean, it's quite heavenly, right? Yeah, because you can have like, you know, I think it's six to twelve months. I think of the. maternity uh leave i would say um and uh uh and, and you have and you get you know you get payment right i mean um it's because i mean in america i mean oftentimes it's you know unpaid leave so you 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 know the only guarantee you get is that you don't get fired from your current job right so th mm -hmm. that's where legal protection applies but not necessarily you know A monetary benefit, right? No. Which is why oftentimes, I mean, mothers, I mean, they would come back to work, you know, like two months after birth, right? Uh, which is, so, you know, yeah. one baby. Maybe not a welfare uh, safety net, but a universal basic income guarantee uh, might do the trick. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, because welfare still means tested, you know, welfare state would be means tested. It would have a behavioral test. It would have a, you know, application and uh, uh, even WIC. I think you have to apply for it in the U.S. But uh, uh, but like with universal, you know, basic income, that would just be a universal, uh, you know, payment. But that wouldn't guarantee, you know, fertility rates because people still have the option, you know, not to have children because it's a voluntary, you know, thing. We can't. legislate that into into law to tell people they have to produce kids right right a legal from a legal standpoint yeah i see where you're getting at it's just you know what i think it's a structure agency question it's structures that uh enable people or encourage people to have kids but then it's also an agency question individuals have choice they have you know autonomy and this is where these two uh big issues collide But in uh, like yeah, like a, a, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, it's a complex matter. I mean, it's like you know, yeah. like what would UBI increase fertility? Um, <laughs> you know, right. because you could, again the, the assumption. I mean, if it's like okay, if it's about individualization, um, uh, you know, if let's say, you know, the idea is that you know the 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 woman can be living independently from the man, um. And if the man knows that, you know, like he wouldn't have the economic control over the woman, um, you know, the, the, like the, 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 there's a, some risk, you know, that the men then become less loyal, right? Okay. Uh, like for instance, the, you know, the birth control pill. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, you are increasing the, the freedom, the opportunities of. For women to you know choose when they become pregnant, um, but but then you know for for the guys they'll be like okay you know um I can you know is it like do 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 I have to be loyal to that one woman right um because I mean oftentimes I mean you know what what created loyalty right the the male loyalty um was you know knocking up the girl so to speak right so I mean if so if 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 she You know, if she had, if she became pregnant, you know, she had the child, uh, then you know, it would be like, yeah, okay, you know, because now I'm going to stay with you because you know because we yeah, have to the raise children. a child together, right? Yeah, obligated. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you create these obligations, and now I mean, if it's like, okay, you know, you might have, 
let's say, you know, uh, many, many years of basically tryouts, right, before you decide to settle and have kids, right? Um, you know, it, 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 it just is a, a greater risk that, you know, the breakup happens uh, before... The decision to get married then uh, ultimately occurs, uh, but but nowadays, I mean, if people do get married, um, firstly, I mean, it happens now at a later age than it used to be, right? So instead of the early twenties, thirties, right? Yeah, it's like late twenties, early thirties. Um, wow. you know, th that will have a negative impact on fertility, right? Because, uh, because you know, fecundity decreases for women at the, the at a higher age, um. And, and and then the you know um but 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 then also like you know the the people that do get married um you know you, you then see the divorce rates are coming down right so they're less likely to get divorced because you know they had such a long trial period right like of making sure that it's a fitting relationship right um so um you know, then it's like now we can say, well, you know, marriages, I mean, they do tend to be um, more stable. Um, but less kids. Yeah, and but in overall, I mean, you have, from a societal stability perspective, I mean... What's uh, J.D. Vance, the single cat lady phenomenon? <laughs> what was it called? I don't want to use that label, but <laughs> single cat Yeah, lady. well, that, that, was, that was the argument that J.D. Yeah. Vance was having, right, with, yes. uh, with the kind of liberal women, right? Yeah. Uh, and you know, who's, who's right about that. I mean, it's, it's, you know, uh, it depends on your perspective. I mean, if, if you're saying that, you know, the only thing that matters is, you know, in the in, in individual choice, individual freedom, then yeah, you would probably side with a liberal woman. Uh, and if, if you're saying that, you know, no, it's social stability is about fertility, right? Maintaining a certain fertility rate, uh, then then you'd probably be on the social conservative side um and uh yeah i mean but, it's a complex debate right yeah i just want to use one case study you know like let's just think of south korea i mean it is structural i mean partly structural that the fertility rate in a place like south korea is so low maybe the opportunity structures for young people to have a family the economic uh, prospect are horrible for young people, and and that it disencourages people to have children in a place like South Korea. Would that be a fair argument that structures are powerful in a place like South Korea that explain the low fertility rate, or is it cultural? Do you think it's something in the culture, uh, like you said, individualization? I don't know much about South Korea, but even with Japan, it comes to mind the expensive nature of housing and, you know, uh, maybe it's partly cultural. I don't know. Maybe there's a shift towards a radical individualization a, away from this family model. Uh, and that, that explains low fertility uh, in places like South Korea or Japan. Well, I mean, or, you, you, or, you, or Switzerland, well, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, you did show me the uh, Yung Chul Han documentary, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and if you remember, like his main, yeah. one of his main theses, uh, um, uh, with the, the burnout society, right? So uh, he, he was saying Great that book. The, we should have talked about that one. <laughs> fits yeah, right? that, that you know, South Korean society. So you know, uh, his home country is kind of uh, emblematic for uh, the burnout, um, and uh, you know where there are very high educational expectations. Right, people have to go to cram schools, they have to do really well on the exams in order to get to the competitive university places. And, you know, and, and, and the issue is that, you know, if, if you're like a high performance society, right? Like Leistungsgesellschaft, right? Yeah. Performance um, society, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, the, it, the, the, the problem with, 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 with that kind of system is that it is what Han described, right? So you're going to have an increase in, yeah. yeah, burnout, right? Uh, people are going to be stressed out all the time. And, you know, and if you look at like, you know, the the, the normal human stress reaction, uh, the bodily stress reaction, um, we know that people become less fertile, right? 
you know, like women are less capable of conceiving, right? Um, because I mean, because I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, I mean, it, it is quite expensive to to rear a child, um, and and I mean this from a like from a physical at the physical level, right? So basically, the the resources that you know the potential mom's body uh, need to put together uh, in order to you know carry a successful pregnancy to term um you know it, 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 you know it 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 requires kind of you know like a s stable environment more or less right um some continuity or security yeah security yeah i i, I think i think i think that's that's hugely important I, you know yeah, i think han I, I think han uh used the german word selbst selbstfleischung <laughs> that the burnout society is marked by this uh self uh, self is like you start eating yourself you, self yeah self yeah cons yeah yeah definitely self self um and i was thinking yeah we start to have this creative destruction uh the dilemma that schumpeter always talked about you know how market forces can have adverse effects and maybe fertility is an adverse effect of this powerful market forces you know, Leistungsgesellschaft, everything is driven with, with performance and individual, uh, uh, you know, an orientation that it is a, then a direct reflection of low fertility rates. You're self-destructing yourself. You're eating yourselves to death, you know, not literally, but metaphorically, you know, <laughs> that people are uh, killing themselves uh, for, you know, to accumulate certain capital amounts or, in a life. And yeah, yeah. The tragedy wow. of commodification of life overall that's, yeah. that's what i get at the philosophy of han he he was very impressive i was really amazed with the insights of a different a different maybe more dystopian you know uh view of modernity what's happening but he's he nailed it i think he really nailed it <laughs> you know yeah brave I mean, new so... world <laughs> brave new world of uh low fertility and low uh expectations yeah yeah, so I mean, anytime like you criticize, you know, a commodification, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you of course draw on this, you know, you could say Marxist strand of thinking and yeah, um, left left wing critique, yeah, yeah, uh, left wing critique, and, yeah. uh, and 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 that's and I think I think that's fair enough. I mean, I think it's probably, you know, our desire to, you know, accumulate capital, um. Is is what's driving us off the cliff. I mean, on, on many many things. Like for instance, I mean, on this issue of like, okay, well, you know, despite having you know the worst kind of storms, you know, in North Carolina, in Spain recently, right, uh, in so many places across the world, you know, people are still doing. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, wh why are we not able to adjust our behavior? Like, why are we not able to? you know, travel less, right? You know, taking planes or driving cars and uh or you know, just polluting the environment. Um we're not able to do it. Um we ultimately well is for first of all, I mean there's this convenience argument. I mean certainly the lifestyle that we have right now is convenient for us. That's why we keep going with it. Leisure, yeah, society. Yeah, is a convenience. Uh, and then the second argument is that that the capitalist system requires it, because I mean, ultimately, I mean, what does commodification mean? I mean, it means you, you have to increase the the number of countable things, right? So if you're like the airline CEO, right? You know, like it's it's um. Every like ticket, the every yeah the tickets <laughs> and the number of tickets that you're able to sell right so and you have to increase those number of tickets uh and so in any organization i mean like you know we're employed at a university and i'm sure that you know the administration sets certain targets that you have to meet right like regarding you know, if it's a teaching college you know you want to you always look at the enrollment right yeah if it's teaching and research then you look at uh, enrollment uh, plus the, the the PhD graduates, plus the research grants, right? And it's so like, it's yeah, it's like a McDonaldization <laughs> of all areas. Uh, 
the, does does expand uniform and uh, calculate you know expand growth and yeah material growth and monetary growth yeah yeah of course uh, Ritzer 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 the monetization thesis he had a different idea but but you could apply that you know in all, a lot of areas uh, market forces uh, you know take over uh, yeah in all all arenas not just fast food anymore you know. Unfortunately, yeah, the market forces take over, and then and then at some point, uh, like something is going to hit the fan, right? Because it's like yeah. you, whether it's like the, yeah. the 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 scale of the environmental destruction, um, or whether it is um, you know, the geopolitical conflicts that become uncontrollable, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, or whether there's a risk for a new pandemic, right? Um. Whether there is uh, the risk of like the, this, you know, like Guy Standing calls it like the precariat, right? Yeah. The precariat class, right? Um, so it, 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 there's there's so many risks that are created, um, you know, through this market capitalist system. Yeah. Um, no safeguards in place. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I mean no, no safety button. <laughs> right. There's no safety button. So basically, I mean. You know, cautionary like, principle. <laughs> you know, if the assumption is that we're on a on a train that's going faster and faster in the direction of jumping yeah. off the cliff, I mean, um, you know, the only thing that we could do, I mean, it's kind of like these small mitigation measures, right? Yeah. Which is like, hey, you know, can we, you know, build in some kind of break? You know, uh, can we can we slow down the train somewhat, right? Yeah. Before uh, the collision. Yeah. <laughs> that's right yeah so and yeah. uh and, and 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 so yeah and so we, there's, there's more and more risks that we have to uh yeah. grapple that we have to handle right um yeah, for instance uh, yeah, yeah i mean the, the risks to democratic systems right i mean you know are we always going to have you know democratic systems you okay. know with free and fair elections um you know it, if 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 the Habermasian argument is correct, I mean, if the legitimacy of capitalist democracies keeps going down, we um, got a legit, then we have a legitimacy crisis. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. if if it gets low enough, I mean, the end game is that there's going to be this one leader who says, you know, you know, v vote for me and I'll fix it for you, but then you're going to have to make me a dictator, right? Yeah, um, and you know, that's the threat of. Uh, you know, Karl Popper, Karl Popper, the uh, Austrian philosopher and his uh, classic, the open society and its enemies, he said, you know, be very wary. I'm not direct quoting here, but he said, be very wary of people who offer a utopian vision, because I think his quote was more, more likely they actually produced hell. So whatever it is, sounds like a perfect utopia, it usually turns into hell. <laughs> And I guess that's somewhat true. I mean, if it sounds too good to be true, there's probably, you know, something wrong with it. Because you got to be realistic. But utopias are easy to sell. And I think maybe uh, populist messages and populist rhetoric uh, always seek simple uh, solutions to simple arguments in a very complex world. You and I know this, that things are much more complex and they can't be solved just through uh, words and scapegoating, you know. So yeah, it's it's a, it's a challenge, I guess, for the next four years, and we'll find out uh, what exactly is going to happen, not just in the U.S., you know, but uh, also in Europe and Ukraine. Uh, you're going to have different political election cycles that are going to happen. Well, there'll be an election yeah. in Germany coming up yeah. soon, right? Uh, January, I think, probably. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, probably go to the right. The conservatives will probably win. Yeah, well, it's, it's so we did, the the, the, yeah. the final timeline has not been decided yet. So, yeah. So just as a little background, so yeah. you know, like the the day after the U.S. elections, uh, the the the, the chancellor Lindner. of Germany fired yeah. the finance minister who was from the FDP, uh, the Christian mm -hmm. Lindner. Um, and uh, the this disagreement was about uh the debt break, right? Okay. Because this was a policy. That was introduced in 2009 under Merkel, um, and the idea was that, you know, well, if a financial crisis happens again, that the you know Germany will never decide to 
increase the national debt, right? Yeah. Uh, or excessively, right? I think they have a few exceptions to that, but for the most part, they wanted to uh, keep the debt in line, and you know, and 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 you know, all three governing parties, right? The FTP, uh, the SPD, and the Greens. Uh, I think they signed on to that agreement uh, at the beginning of the of their term, uh, and then the Ukraine war happened, right? And uh, uh, so, and, and then, and, and then, the budget picture changed significantly because, firstly, oh. you know, because of energy you know, crisis, the, yeah. right? So you have the energy crisis. Um, so the German subsidies for oh. uh, energy is 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 increasing, uh, right? Uh, then you have the aging population. So you have welfare state. Yeah, yeah. The boomers are retiring. You have an increase in the you know, pension subsidies, right? Uh, and then the third factor is Ukraine, right? So you have, you know, ever more demands for, yeah. you know, German resources, you know, military and, you know, financial. And, it, and you know, in Ger to be fair, in Germany, uh, you, you get money as a refugee. I mean, it's a, I think it's the, uh, basically unemployment insurance amount. Give or take, I think that's the amount. I'm not sure exactly the amount, but it's so you get some kind of an income uh, while you have refugee status. Uh, but every state may have a different like uh, a card or something. But as I recall, that uh, basic uh, unemployment insurance is is granted to to refugees. Is the last time I checked it. Now, if it changed, I may may make a mistake, but I think it was. And that drives up the support for the AFD and the PSD. Yeah, right? yeah. Exactly the same kind of uh, rhetoric you would hear in the U.S. that uh, you know immigrants are getting the payments and none of the natives are. You hear that same rhetoric over there. Uh, yeah, definitely same rhetoric. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so these are all issues that are coming up now, and yeah. uh, and and then and it's it's interesting to look at the timing. So, I mean, obviously the. Uh, the ample coalition. I mean, they did. They they did have to, um, like agree on a budget for next year. Right. Um. So. Uh. And then this is the. Oh, you gonna share you know, screen? Okay. Cool. The, the the no no I don't have anything here. But um. Oh okay okay. Oh, we'll you wanted to share? You wanted to share something? I no mean, no no no. I'm good. Can... I'm good. Uh, no, um, but but yeah, I mean, so the the issue um is that uh, yeah, so you have the yeah they had to agree on a budget, but the disagreements had been going on for a long time, and and I think the FTP they they do want to have snap elections, yeah, um, because you know, I mean it, it's a complex matter, right? Because you know, because right now the FTP is at what three percent, maybe in the polls, four yeah, percent. They got eliminated in, uh, in the East German, uh several states. They were totally annihilated. They were, I think, knocked out totally in Sachsen and in uh, uh, what's the other Sachsen Anhalt. Uh, but I don't know about Brandenburg, but uh, yeah, they were totally annihilated in the state elections, which which means that they didn't have seats anymore. No more seats. Yeah, I mean that's why I find it so questionable. I mean, yeah. why the FTP chair wants to have snap elections because you know, yeah. you know if you know you're going to be wiped out, I mean, you want to have as few delay, elections as possible. Delay the uh, eventual consequence. Yeah, yeah, you want to delay for as long as possible, and so you know, I I think he has a belief that you know if he stands up for. You know, Schwarzenegger, right? Uh, this kind of like zero deficit, right? He'll get some backers. <laughs> yeah, then there's then ma magically there's going to be get, more FTP at least, supporters. They'll get at least five percent, so they'll still be in a, a parliament in Bundestag. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, oh, but or 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 they form a coalition with the uh, the CDU. That could possibly happen. I don't know, but they wouldn't have enough. Uh, unless... well, the two parties don't have enough right now. Yeah, you I mean, is at thirty five percent. Yeah, so it would have um, to be. A, it would have to be a new election. Yeah, with new, uh, entirely new uh, electorate. I mean, uh, seats and representatives. 
members coming in. Yeah, I mean, it appears to be like Mertz is kind of like a centrist of the, yeah. the, the chairman of the CDU. So um, he, he does not want to coalesce with AFD and with PSW, right? But there's Serda, Serda, Marco Serda. He's the right wing of the, uh, I mean, they're of the, the union CA, party. Yeah. They are, they are technically unified in the Bundestag, but they are separate parties. So they play it both ways. So basically they are usually together as a unit, but they are separate parties, uh, treated as separate parties. So yeah, it yeah it could easily go either way, uh, but definitely I I predict that it will be a conservative win, and then it'll just uh, form a new coalition, whatever. Maybe a grand coalition. Maybe yeah, it's probably with SPD. I think yeah, I mean, so right, like right now in so Austria, C yeah, <laughs> yeah, CDU is at like thirty five percent, um, and then the SPD is at about sixteen percent. So I think it would probably be enough. Yeah, like do a grand coalition. Yeah. Which confirms that uh, graphic you showed earlier uh, was it ruling parties always get punished <laughs> regardless? Yeah, or uh, like yeah, I mean every... SPD they used to have twenty five percent. So they... then, uh, if they are incumbent, they will get punished. So it will immediately. <laughs> yeah, damned if they do, it's damned if they do, damned if they don't. I mean, either way, so it's almost like a foreclong a foregone conclusion. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but then. You know, there, there might be some positive news there, um, you know, for Ukraine at least. So because okay. because if Mertz becomes chancellor, you know, he might actually uh, give the Taurus, right? You know, he might give more weapons to, yeah, yeah. to Ukraine, right? So there might be like small modular differences, but I don't think it's going to be a game changer necessarily in the war. Well, um, they, I don't, they want to increase defense spending. I know that. Um, Bundeswehr, they want to increase it uh significantly which yeah. is you know nothing compared to u.s military expenditures but or even uh austrian you know uh army uh but y'all are neutral so it doesn't matter right <laughs> yeah and you see this is this whole argument of like oh you know we don't want to do these military expenditures because you know we want to you know continue having a very expensive welfare state uh, and obviously, you're going to start to have to make these trade-offs, uh, you know, and 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 then kind of like, you know, the SPD and the Greens, they were saying, you know, we can kind of afford both things, right? You can, mm -hmm. you can afford to support Ukraine, and then you can afford the welfare state expansion, right? And then fight climate change, <laughs> and you can fight climate change. You can make the investments in the future, and. Uh... And the SPD and the Greens, they just want to increase the deficit, right? Uh, they want to say, well, you know, this is a down payment for important investments that we're doing right now. And um, and the FTP, they just they just want to have the zero deficit, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, this is this is. I mean, ultimately, I mean, it's a non-reconcilable position, and the thing that. Yes, yeah, I mean yeah. that the FTP was definitely the wrong partner in, in that coalition, right? They're trying to combine neoliberalism with uh, social democracy, but <laughs> well, no, would that work? <laughs> no, it won't work. Yeah, yeah, in, <laughs> in free market it, kind of with uh, it's, it's tough. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, is it back then? You remember under Helmut Schmidt, right? So, uh, -huh. uh Helmut Schmidt and uh, uh Willy SPD. Brandt. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was like an SPD-led government with the FTP was kind of the junior partner. But I mean, you, you have to notice, like back then, I mean. Like it was so unbalanced, right? I think like the SPD had something like forty plus percent, and then the FTP had about like ten percent or something, right? Mm -hmm. It was a very unbalanced coalition, right? Um, yeah. And uh, and then it was mostly, you know, SPD policy, and then and of course, I mean, the, the liberals they had a few, you know, yeah. famous politicians like Ralph Darendorf was a oh yeah, uh, like a big. Big uh, shots sociologist. Big time. Or, and then or, he uh, or, got his British citizenship, and I think he ended up becoming a lord. Uh, uh, I read a lot of his books. Uh, Darndorf, a uh, unique uh, combination of being both an academic and politician, you know. Uh, I think he was in a Bundestag, wasn't he, for a while? Yeah, in Germany, he, he um, served within the FTP, yeah. right? He was a... He, uh, yeah, he, uh, he had a long life, uh, uh, and then he, then he became a British citizen, I followed the some of the biography that you can read up on Wikipedia, but uh, 
yeah, that definitely fits with that political sociology kind of uh, kind of com combination. The fact that he was politician and at the same time academic. Yeah, he was you know? a leader in the St. Anthony's College. Uh, okay, there we at go. University of Oxford. Yeah. Do, uh, do, Yeah, and yeah. I, I was there, you know, St. Anthony's oh, College. Oh, you know, oh, wow. No, 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 no I, I was just, just for dinners. I mean, I was not part of a yeah. college, but yeah, there. The only other academic that I can think of that uh, managed to combine politics and sociology, Anthony Giddens comes to mind. I think he was an advisor to Blair and Clinton. Uh, in you know, then, then you probably know more about this than I do, Larry, but. Yeah, Anthony Giddens, uh, he, he played a significant role, at least in British sociology. I read a lot of his, what, uh, structuration theory, third way. He wrote he wrote all, all sorts of topics. Constitution of society. He was, yeah, it was great, great, great thinker. The, uh, more of a theorist. Yeah, definitely. The same thing with Darndorf. I think Darndorf was more of a class theorist. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, and he was one of the big, you know, leaders in within the FTP right back in back in those days yeah. in the seventies. Um yeah. and um yeah but 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 yeah I mean FTP I mean they they uh I, I they, they did change their outfit uh quite a bit um under under the current leadership Christian Lindner. Yeah. Um so you know Lindner is like you know he's like a full on neoliberal right I mean it's like believes in like you know uh zero debt you know low public sector investments you know uh, encouraging private entrepreneurship lowering taxes on businesses mm -hmm. um and uh it's just a good oh, plain, yeah. you know business you know pro market business, orientation yeah, business clientele kind yeah of and, and then he's go he's, he's gonna have a hard time within you know, an SPD Green coalition. Um, yeah, I mean the, the SPD and Greens. I think they they have they have a lot of like, um, like you know, common agenda, right? Because I mean, like they 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 might like emphasize the environmental topic a little bit differently. Mm. Um, because you know the SPD, I think they have a lot of like, you know, working class voters. You know, they might be in more heavily polluting industries, right? So there might be. Uh, a different kind of emphasis, right? Uh, but uh, but for the most part, because of the you know left leaning social agenda, right? And mm -hmm. also the fact that like both of these parties, they get a lot of support from kind of our class, right? Which is like the academics, the intellectuals, you know, the yeah the professional class, right? Um, Which yeah, it. Uh, I wanted to raise another point. Uh, with Lindner, I saw him a lot on Marcos Lanz shows, even in the early days when he was very young. You know, I think I think he is in mid thirties right now. Maybe he's forty. Uh, I remember 40, seeing so. him. Yeah, I remember seeing him when he was young, a very young a German politician. And one of the things that they do, I think, in Europe when they try to recruit young people, is they put them on TV shows, like with Marcos Lanz. And they get exposure. And what I like about this is it, it enters into this, this Habermasian, you know, uh, they become experts in the way they speak, in the way they can uh, simplify political rhetoric. Uh, and again, and then, you know, and then what they do in their political careers is different. I agree there. But what's fascinating, I watched the last uh, about 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 a week a week ago on Marcus Lantz, he invited all of the youth uh, kind of leaders of the parties on his show, and these people are like in their twenties, you know, and he's kind of just like you know posing questions, he's trying to get him to, you know, uh, answer it. It's very useful. Uh, uh, if you have time, I recommend it. It was really good. But this is going to be the next generation. Right. So the generation that we saw of people, they're pretty much going out. They're probably going to retire, but there's going to be a new generation of uh, leaders uh, emerging soon. So who knows? I may uh, shake things up in the German uh, or even Austrian. I'm kind of curious who will be the next leaders, you know, S SPU or uh, the Greens or the, yeah, or, 
because it's going to be the next generation. I mean, uh, I think they don't want them to be older than 50, my, unless they're Mertz or something. I think they want them to be in their 30s or 40s. <laughs> I generally notice in, in, in European politics, they, they are younger. Uh, U.S. may be an exception. They just are much older. They, <laughs> uh, You know what I mean by leaders, with, with the exception to Vance. He's an exception, but like everybody else, it seems to be older. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. the U.S. political system has a different logic, right? So, yeah, older the because, better, I guess. Uh, well, yeah, because it's, <laughs> it, because it's about the individual politician, right? Yeah. Um, versus, you know, the European politics is very party centric. So, you know, the party is kind of like, okay, you know, the way how we can, you know, remain up to date with the current electorate is we have to push, you know, the, the, the seniors into kind of minor roles and we have to promote, you know, the younger people within the party. We have a lot of energy, yeah. Yeah, they have more energy, right? And we can yeah. push them forward. Versus, I mean, if you have like an individualist political system like in the U.S., right, where, you know, the the, the Democrats and the Republicans are kind of like the, the it's it's like the mantle, right? Yeah. Right. So you're so you're, you're a party member, but ultimately, you know, it's about you within the congressional district, you know, or within the state, within the Senate seat. And so oftentimes, and uh, and, and, you, and you get seniority power, right? So somebody who has been in the Senate for 30 years, you know, is going to have, you know, way more power than somebody who just entered the Senate, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and so, and, and that, that creates a very different incentive, right? Because now it's like... Lever it, it's like a leverage, I think. Yeah, it's like a lifetime appointment, they, they see it, uh -huh. right? Like almost like yeah. Rome. <laughs> yeah, and, and and then right, I mean like or somewhere like Joe Biden, right? I mean he's like the, the classic, you know, like Washington politician, right? Forty plus years, right? 50 yeah, plus. he entered the Senate in nineteen seventy three. Oh wow. You know, so about fifty years ago. Uh then he was a senator until two thousand eight, and then he became vice president. Um, and then there's a short hiatus, and then he became president, right? So, mm -hmm. so he's basically, I mean, he's the personification of the of the Washington politician, right? Uh, long, long, yeah, political career. Yeah, yeah. yeah and so this, 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 that, that, that's that, that that's kind of normal, right? I mean, and uh, uh, it's very hard to push these people from the chairs. I mean, you kind of. I have to drag them out or, you know, they have to die in office more or less, right? Yeah. Well, there was a case, uh, a Virginia uh, senator. I think he was in his 90s. His name, last name was Bird, I think, Bird. Yeah, it got to the point where he couldn't speak hardly. or had difficulty speaking in speeches. And that's usually the, you know, that's uh, uh, the sign that's, you know, the person is yeah no longer fit you know for political office at that point i guess yeah the I mean, same thing happened to the california senator uh oh, right uh what was his name again Her feinstein name, yeah. diane oh, feinstein yeah 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 she died uh, in office yeah she died in office and then i think like at the end it was like her advisors who were basically running you know, her job and you know she was just like okay where am i you know what am i doing you know so, uh, she was like somewhat yeah. used in the, in the mental state uh but but actually the, the, the staffers i mean i think they're perfectly happy to yeah have a non-competent uh, senator because then it gives them more power right they have, they have more freedom to do whatever they want um uh, definitely yeah 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 but, but, but uh, of course it's problematic for the country because it's just like okay, you know, you don't have, you know, people who know how to, you know, speak proper sentences. Um, but it's also, I think, a testament to like the stability of the U.S. political system, right? It, it, it's just like you you don't actually need, you know, every cog in the wheel to function perfectly, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because you know, the, the the system, I mean is you know has enough you know stability I mean, yeah yeah modularity right uh to 
and that's continuity for sure. Stay, stay alive. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even even during the worst of it, right? Like the January sixth moment, right? Um, it was just like, yeah. I mean, the next day, you know, uh, we just send more police out there, more national guard, and then uh, have a peaceful inauguration, transfer of power, right? Yeah. So uh, the situation can stabilize very quickly again. Uh, Definitely, that's it. definitely. Yeah. All right. Uh, so that that does suggest to me that, like you know, the U.S. I mean has, you know, stable, durable institutions, and you know, and if I may venture the proposition that, you know, that that we're going to survive the second Trump presidency, you know, uh, you know, you But, you. You might go make ahead. the argument in, in not such a great shape as we used to be. I'm I'm not sure, but uh, I I think you know we we'll, we'll be able to make it out of it on the other side. You know. Yeah. Principle of hope. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, you're kind of sick, Larry. I noticed. <laughs> you got a No, no, no. It's just uh, a little you're good. bit of You're a good. clogged nose. I mean, Yeah. 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 All it'll right. clear up very soon again. Yeah. Let's. Anything else uh, that I forgot to mention? Is there anything else that we forgot to discuss? Hmm. Uh, I think. with, with, with what's happening in the world, I, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I think, you know, the, you know, uh, the, the, this, you know, things that we have to, you know, look, look forward to, obviously, um, at, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I like, yeah, in, like, we, you know, we have to, I think, you know, we have to promote, you know, a positive vision to some extent, right? Of course. Uh, We also have to, as long as it's not utopian. uh yeah yeah <laughs> i mean well, it's a little, a little bit, a little bit of realism too, but yeah, yeah. yeah i mean the you know the positive vision i mean is is, is hopefully that uh you know the, the, hopefully that the political polarization is going to decrease um i mean of course i'm concerned that it pr will probably increase in the immediate future uh because you know Trump is just an antagonistic figure. I mean, that's just this is his, his nature. Um, and then, of course, the people that oppose him on the other side, they're going to be active again. Um, Yeah. you know, so As long as it doesn't turn violent, you know, or you know, violent. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that 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 would that would be a major issue for sure. But I mean, uh, on the geopolitics, I mean, I hope that. You know, if 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 madman theory is correct, uh, that uh, that could actually, you know, stabilize the political situation, you know, in in Iran and Russia, China, whatever, all these other places. Uh, you know, the, the idea that well, if there's somebody who is not so stable within the White House, maybe, uh, maybe I don't want to mess too much uh, with with them, um, and then and Okay. then. That's that. Okay. And and with the domestic politics, it's like I I want to see like you know like this whole issue of like chronic diseases, you know, healthcare, you know, um, I I I think that, you know if, like if we can move the needle on that one, right? Um, because it's clearly not a sustainable system. I mean, to you know have more and more sick people, and then you know we just feed them more and more drugs, right? Uh, but then the drugs, I mean, they they never, you know, fixing or reversing things, right? Uh, I mean, yes, I, I I did see the numbers on Ozempic, right? Where, like, when people were taking these, you know, GLP one agonists, right? Uh, these um, hormones that affect their hunger hormones, that it actually, uh, we 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 have seen a small decline in obesity rate, uh, Oh, so really? one or two percentage points, I think. Um, but I, I, but it's a, it's a big question. I mean, like, is is that is that the best route For... towards the weight loss, right? Um, because I mean, I, because I, 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 cause I think like there's, you know, if you do a a food based weight loss program, I think it's going to be much more uh, effective, um, and it will have much fewer side effects. 
just a pharmaceutical kind of approach to it, or like Yeah, a, the pharmaceutical approach is always risky. You're messing with your hormones. Um, you know, in in the milder cases, I mean, you just have, you know, nausea or you, you know, because of a loss of appetite, you might be not eating like the essential nutrients. Um, so you get different kinds of um, like an, anemia and stuff like that. Um, so... And in, in, in the extreme cases, I mean, there have been some people who have died from taking these drugs. Uh, side effects yeah. yeah, these are severe side effects, you know, quite rare, but, you know, they can still happen. And so, um, yeah, so it's something about, like, we can, you know, educate people about proper nutrition, you know, better diets, uh, you know, exercise regime. I think. Mean, I think. Yeah. I mean, if we can get people in the direction of of, of better health, I think that would be uh, that would I think be 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 a major objective. I would think. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, so, so, so th 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 those would be, I think, you know, my two positive visions, right? Um, you know, for the country and for the world, right? Um, it's good. No, it's. I think it's a good. So especially in the first two decades of the 21st century, you know, food uh, and health are, are going to be crucial just as much as economic. Uh, I know we separate those two or three often, but they, they're intertwined. Health outcomes, life expectancy and uh, yeah, healthy. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's what Andrew Yang talked about, right? Yeah. Which is that like, you know, you, it's like, I mean, you have to define the metrics that you want to optimize on because, I mean, right now, I mean, if you're saying that, you know, GDP is the only thing that I care about um, because, you know, money is easy to count and and everybody wants to make more money, right? Well, I mean, by everybody, I mean, I think but they mean the, the capitalists, right? The mm -hmm. the capital. um, and, then we, and we kind of have to follow along because we work for these capitalists, right? Not the false metric, yeah, metric, yeah, yeah, and then, and then of course, like you know, then that metric becomes the ideal, but then you know that metric can come at the expense of something else, right? So I mean, you, I mean, we can increase the pharmaceutical profits uh, by having more people, you know, being obese and having metabolic syndrome, yeah. um, but 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 in terms of like the overall functioning of society, I mean, it's going to be much worse. Because we know that people that, you know, have too much weight, they're going to have a very hard time, you know, functioning properly. Uh, so, Especially when they get older. Yeah. Yeah. Elderly. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, that's right. So, you know, you have to maintain yourself in, uh, in, in good health. But but I think it, it, it does require some, you know, some knowledge, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I I saw like recently it was like a news clip. It was about um, the history of like uh, grocery stores and, uh, and and the grocery stores like they became really big uh, after I want to say nineteen teens twenties, uh, and that was when uh, yeah it was it was it was a news clip about um, store bread. Right, which is different than like freshly baked bread, right? So you go to a break bakery shop, which there's a lot of them in the European countries, right? Oh yeah, uh, like freshly baked bread, and... right? Um, but uh, but then within the supermarkets, you know, you have, you know, uh, the store bread, uh, and, and the store bread, I mean, is 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 like it's it's like centrally baked, right? Within uh, like a warehouse, I suppose, uh, and um, and 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 they put all kinds of fillers into it, like it's these. Chemical, yeah, it's kind of like these long Latin names, or like you know food ingredients, um, and uh, and they are all supposed to enhance the flavor, and increase the the shelf life, right? And uh, this is. That's why they uh, don't go bad. <laughs> they don't ever uh, turn green or anything. Yeah, they they, they, they don't go bad, and then they always have the same consistency, right? It's always like nice and fluffy, and uh, and and, and nice and chewy, right? 
So they always have like the same predictable consistency. So, you know, people buy it and then it's like, oh, it, it always looks nice and I can keep it on the shelf for a very long time. And, but then if you eat it, right, oh. then eventually, I mean, over long periods of time, you're going to get sick from it. Uh, but, the, you know, the grocery stores, I mean, they really like to stock up with those kinds of things. Oh, yeah. If you think about like a pure, you know, fresh food market, I mean, you know, it's kind of like, it's like a farmer's market, right? That's like a pure fresh food market. And you get and you get and even in a fresh food market. I mean, you can already see. Okay, look at those tomatoes that are already like looking yeah. like really soft and yeah, yeah, and and, and 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 wasted, right? But you get you get a better natural value, and you're getting nutritious. Whereas in a grocery store, it's synthetic. You know, it's it's probably not even real. I mean, it's genetically modified. A lot of times. You can even look on cereal boxes. It will say this product was bioengineered. <laughs> it's very open now. But like you know, uh, like you said, I mean, if you go to a natural market, you get the natural thing. You're you're getting the uh, from the farm straight to the you know table there. But with uh, grocery stores, you know, it's not so clear. You know where it goes, where it transitioned to middle people and chemicals involved. That's why I think with the uh, E. coli outbreak, with the hamburgers, that means there's something that went wrong in the food chain uh, and during the process of uh, transportation, of how it's manufactured or how it's transported, and then it has a risk. E. coli, you know, uh, not to say that wouldn't happen if you didn't even had a natural production process. You could still have, you know, various kinds of... Uh, bio i guess bio, organisms that could uh cause problems make you sick but when it's so massive when it's so massive you know uh, our food supply the way it's produced and it's a greater risk because we can't control it it's so massive you know with the <laughs> big farms in california and right and we don't know exactly what chemicals they're using because it's not you know yeah that's right i mean and, and, and yeah. you know and, and then the introduction of chemicals i mean it always has a very pragmatic component behind it, right? Which is like, oh, you know, we want to make, you know, we want to, it's like a weed killer, for instance, right? Or oh, because we don't want the weed um, to kill the crops, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, or, you know, we want to, yeah, increase the shelf life of that uh, product, right? Um, so it, it always has like a good purpose and that's why it's being used. But then it has a negative externality, right? Because oftentimes, I mean, if you accumulate too much of those chemicals in your body by through ingestion, um, you know, then you have, you know, a neurotoxin, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to start, you know, impacting your health negatively. Um, and the issue is that, I mean, so you, it's a something, I mean, like our bodies are very well adjusted in the sense that like if you, if you add like a small amount of toxins, I think you know you, you know that's the job of the liver, right? You know it's supposed to do the, you know, the cleaning, right? Uh, and, and and keep you healthy. Um, the issue is, I mean, if you eat the supermarket foods every day because you know you because n none of us have our own garden, right? Yeah. Uh, well, then 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 you have an issue because then you have the accumulation over years and maybe decades of. Uh, yeah. Kind of your poisonous eating, um, so, uh, but nonetheless, I mean, I, I, I think that even like, you know, within a supermarket, I think there's a hierarchy, right? Yeah. And the hierarchy is simply that you know, if if you stick with the outer aisles of the supermarket, for the most part, right, uh, with the exception of like well, maybe spices or you know, so. You find an interior aisle, but or uh, and uh, also oils. Um, but uh, but the outer aisles, you know, um, you know the fresh produce, fruits, vegetables. Then you go to the dairy section, the cheeses, um, the cream and stuff. Uh, then all of the meats. Um, 
and then that's it, you know. And then if you if you don't get other stuff, then then I think you're. So, so okay, I, I see what you're getting. So the outer aisles would be the safest bet, the the most because it's produce, but anything that's processed in the box, you would say it's bad. Yeah, Am I get it right. Did I, did I simplify it? That, that, that's right. Yeah, yeah, Okay, yeah. Does that So make just any you know, sense? like meat, meat, dairy, Yeah. uh, and then the fresh produce, right? So no TV dinners, no anything uh, frozen and then reheated. You think that would be bad, Well, there's a right? few exceptions. So if 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 it's let's say if it's like a frozen fruit, right, or if it's like frozen vegetables, you know, in most cases, like it's it's just a pure ingredient, right? Uh, and then if you get like let's say, you know, frozen chicken breast, but it's like it's it's cut up. Um, then it depends. I mean, like let's say if it has like a coating on it. You know, like I don't know, some kind of like flour mixture or something, uh, or like corn, corn meal or corn flour or something. Uh, yeah, you, you don't want to get that. But but if it's only let's say, you know, if it only has the chicken, maybe a few spices, then that that's good, right? Yeah. Um, Okay. yeah, That's a good ch that's chicken a good nuggets. one. I I would Yeah. say is not not so good. Um. Now there's different opinions about processed meats, you know, like your salamis and, you know, prosciutto and, uh, Yeah. like sausages and, and bacon. Um, I I would say they are fine, uh, for the most part, uh, because even though they they might have some other ingredients, they might have some sugar, some dextrose, um, but the amount of it is oftentimes minuscule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's Definitely. like like you know one or two grams of sugar or something, you know, per slice, or there were several slices. Um, so it's I don't see it as much of a concern. Um, yeah, and then even other kinds of like cheap meats again, you know, like like ham, you know, uh, like you know bologna or whatever, something like that. Um, yeah, th th those like spam. Uh, th those are still infinitely better. Yeah. than um most of the ultra processed food that you find in the supermarket shelf yeah yeah that's a good suggestion yeah it makes it makes sense yep definitely yeah to eat yeah uh, around uh you go to a grocery store eat on the outer edges just only in the aisle yeah oh, oh. yeah okay and the other thing i notice is like if they give you like your know, aldi right the little i mean those are You know, those are discount stores, uh, which I don't know whether in Louisiana or in In Texas, Texas, yeah. where do you have them? Uh, Yeah, they have them. They have we have Aldi's. Yeah, in Texas. yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, they they have a good model, right? Where, you know, they I would say I'd spend about, you know, thirty forty dollars less uh, at at Aldi per week. Yeah. Um. You know, per shopping trip. So you know, uh, like for instance, like the the pasture raised eggs, which are usually what I recommend, right? So like with a dark orange yolk. Um, you know, like it's like five dollars a dozen. You know, if I if I go to Giant, which is the main supermarket here, you know, it's like ten dollars a dozen, right? Wow, that's a markup. That's you know, quite a markup, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow. And then you buy like two pieces of the ribeye steak, let's say. You know, it's about twelve dollars or so. Uh huh. Um, you know, it, it, you would probably pay at least twenty dollars for it to, to giant or something. Uh, Oh, wow. Huh. yeah. So, uh, yeah. So it's 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 if 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 but but in terms, yeah. But if you look for like variety of sausages, I would say yeah. I mean, probably the giant is, or the you know um. Shop rights, they might have a more of a selection of that. Uh, Yeah, definitely. yeah, if you want a wide selection, then you know, like a like a mainstream American supermarket is better, right? Um, But more expensive. but it will cost <laughs> more, yeah, for yeah, sure. definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, this is quite complex All right. there. Okay, Okay. so uh, Let's then quit. Yeah. I'll, I'll uh. Good.
all the it podcast was good. and uh, all right. thanks Mike for the discussion. Oh.